There's so many cooks in the kitchen, so many recipes to share. So many cooks in the kitchen with meals for you to prepare. We've got fruits and grains, veggies and beans, more healthy food than you've ever seen. So many cooks in the kitchen, plant-based meals to prepare. So many cooks in the kitchen with ideas we're happy to share. Hello, everybody. My name is Dilla Barman. I'm one of the cooks in the kitchen. Happy New Year and welcome to our first show of the year. I'm one of about several dozen cooks in the kitchen. We're all Food for Life instructors. Food for Life is a nutrition education program of the Physicians Committee. We have a variety of classes that are based on evidence that show you how to stay healthy. And if you end up in some unfortunate situation with diabetes, cancer, um, uh, blood pressure issues, ways we can, ways that food can help you. So we do this program every month. Uh, this is our first of the year. And today's episode is about soups. I'm the first of about a dozen of us who are going to be sharing information about soups. What does soup mean to you? I know when I was growing up in the old days, soup would be what my mom would make if I wasn't feeling well. So soup is a great choice of food for when you're not feeling well, but it's an even better choice when you are feeling well. So soup to me means a liquidy concoction, perhaps with some vegetables, other ingredients in it. Um, there's different terms. There's soups, there's stews. To me, a stew is like a soup, but it's more chunky. And I make a really delicious, hearty stew where I use seitan. We'll probably have a program a little later about what is seitan and how to use it. Uh, so soups are generally more liquidy. Um, then some people enjoy chili. Chili is spicy. It often has beans and chili powder. My parents are from India, so many of you who are familiar with Indian food will know what dal is. Dal is a, is a thick soup, so perhaps we could call it a stew that's lentil-based. In the South, they, do, they use something called samber, which is similar. The spices are a little bit different. And then there's also a more liquidy Indian soup called rasam. My mom used to make a really nice rasam with chunks of potatoes in it. Uh, soup doesn't have to be hot. Today, uh, I think all of the uh, soups we're preparing uh, will be hot or warm, but one of my favorite soups I make around 4th of July is my watermelon gazpacho. It's, it's cold, it's served cold, and it's delicious. It has some fruits in it, it has some jalapeno, uh, and it has watermelon. It's my watermelon gazpacho, and it's really good. So soup doesn't have to be hot. Um, soup is a great way of adding more nutrition to your food because you can blend if you want, and you can use, we like to talk about the power plate, and you can put everything from the power plate in your soups. Certainly vegetables. Uh, legumes are a great thing to add to soups, beans, lentils. Um, grains, whole grains are great. They add a nice chunk. And even, even fruits. fruits. Our, Our recipes, recipes are available. We posted that on the Facebook page. Uh, so the recipes are available, and I've posted a recipe, perhaps others have as well, to one of my soups, which has everything from the power plate, which has something from each element of the power plate. So you can easily integrate a lot of things, from a lot of different kinds of foods. Um, soups are easy as a main or as a side dish. So if you make a particularly hearty soup, that could really be dinner. Maybe serve a few crackers on the side, uh, maybe some celery sticks, some carrot sticks. That could be all you need for dinner. Or it could be a side dish. You could make a light soup or even a hearty soup with just a small serving and then make, make the rest of your dinner. So soups are great for uh, main or side dishes. Um, and they're really good as leftovers. A lot of foods, when you have a lot of ingredients together, if you let them sit overnight in the refrigerator and reheat it, the ingredients get married um, more and more with each other and they taste even better. And vice versa, you can take leftovers and say, I have all these leftovers, what do I do for dinner? Put the leftovers in a pan, add some water. If you have some vegan bouillon, add that in. And you have soup. So you can make soup out of leftovers or you can enjoy your existing soup as a leftover. Now, one of the keys for making a good soup is the broth, the liquid. So if you just throw some vegetables in, put some water, bring it to a boil, you probably won't have a very good soup. Um, there are, I, I used to use a vegan bouillon cube. I'm a little bit wary of bouillon cubes. They tend to be high in sodium. I found a brand I liked, Rapunzel brand, and it had a low sodium 
uh, cube, and it's difficult to find nowadays. So um, other ways to enhance the flavor of the broth is if you pressure cook. One thing I find is ingredients like carrots, and I don't know scientifically why, but when I pressure cook a carrot, I think it's because the pressure is really pushing the molecules of flavor into the, into the carrot. These are the tastiest carrots when you pressure cook them. Pressure cooking is a great way to add flavor. Slow cooking is a great way to add flavor. Uh, you can make your own broth. Uh, what, the scraps we have, like tops of carrots and peels of onions, things like that, we compost. But what you could do is you can put your scraps in a pan, put nine times as much water, bring it to um, a, a boil, and then reduce your heat to very low, simmer it for at least three hours, and then decant it. The solids that are left behind, you can compost or grind up in your drain, and the, the uh, liquid would be a very nice broth. Okay? So today I'm going to be making a carrot ginger soup. I'm going to ask my daughter to join us in a minute. And it's very easy because I'm going to be blending it. I'm going to be using carrots, and uh, I'm going to be blending the, the soup. So here's my blender. Um, I have a high-powered vitamin blender. You don't need a high-powered blender. And one thing I love about the soup is it's so easy. I, I'm going to do a little bit of chopping just to make the blend go a little easier. I'm going to just very roughly chop. So there you go. I just chopped this carrot into three pieces. Easy peasy. The recipe, of course, is available. So I'm using four carrots. Such. And um, you can... You can be lazy with this, which is what I'm doing, and just roughly cut the carrots. Uh, and then I'm going to throw in uh, about a quarter of an onion. And if I want, I can do a quick chop. I really don't need to. Let me just cut it very quickly. I didn't need to do that, but let's go ahead and do that just to get the blend going a little faster. Three cloves of garlic. And then about a tablespoon of ginger. Ginger is a great food. Uh, Neil Barnard, who started the Physicians Committee, he has a great book called Foods That Buy Pain. I highly recommend anything Neil Barnard has written. Foods That Buy Pain, one thing that impressed me, I read this about 15, 20 years ago, is ginger just has so many great uh, properties. It's an anti-inflammatory. It helps with digestion. It helps with nausea. So it has, and it has many other great properties. Carrots, of course, are full of vitamin A and K. They're full of beta carotene. Beta carotene actually ends up becoming vitamin A and it's full of good antioxidants. There goes the ginger. Um, this is what ginger looks like. So what I did is I simply rinsed it, and then I cut a little bit, and then I peeled the skin off, and then I, and then I put it in my blender, okay? I forgot I have one more carrot, so let's throw the carrot in. We're gonna talk about carrots for a second. So here's my carrots. Um, I love carrots, and here are some colored carrots. This has a combination of purple carrots and white carrots, and and orange carrots. I love purple carrots. I love white carrots. They have a really nice flavor. And it would make for a good soup. But the reason I'm not using that is because um, it would change the color. I like the, the bright orange color of the soup. Okay. So now I'm going to add um, some water. So two cups of water. I'm going to add a little bit of salt. And my recipe gives you some guidance. I know some people are careful about how much salt they use because of blood pressure issues, so talk to your healthcare provider before making any dietary changes, but make sure that salt is appropriate. You don't need to add salt. I love lemon pepper. It's one of the spices I really like. I'm going to add a little bit of lemon pepper. The uh, measurements are in the recipe. I love garlic granules or garlic powder, so there goes some garlic. I know we have fresh garlic, but I love the garlic granules. And then the secret to making the stick is some cashews, so I bought some Raw cashews, they're not really raw. I don't know if you know this, but cashews have to be cooked. They're poisonous when they come off the tree. So they're never really raw, but this is not roasted cashews. Uh, so there they go, unsalted, quote unquote, raw cashews. And then uh, my good friend Brenda Davis, who wrote an appendix, as she has been doing to our recipes, uh, talked a lot about how important beans are, and soups are a great way to integrate even more beans. I cooked in my pressure cooker some baby navy beans. You could also use cannellini beans. I like these because they're white. They won't change the color much. Um, and I suggest a cup of the beans. Let's put those in. I'll tell you a story is I made this with a cup and a half of beans. My family loves my carrot ginger soup. I liked it. They didn't like it with a cup and a half. And so I, I went back to a cup last night just to try it, and they all loved it. So I guess that's the magic number. So a cup of beans, um, and that's it. So there's my soup. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to be very loud just for a moment. So 
if you have a high powered blender, if you don't have a high powered blender at this point, put it into a pan and heat it. But my Vitamix goes so fast that if I let it run for seven, eight minutes, it will be steaming. And that's what I do. So I have one less pan to clean up. Um, but what I've done is I have already made the soup. Let me add a little more heat. And I'm going to invite my daughter, Anu, to join us. And you can see as the cashews kick in, look how thick this has become. And you can switch your preference. If you say that's too thick for me, look at that. I love thick soups. And if you don't like it that thick, just add some more water. So let me serve a bowl. And I'm going to ask my daughter to give this a sample. To me, food has to look pretty, has to be nutritious, and has to taste good. So um, I would argue this is looking pretty nice. So here's a small serving for you. A new is a kid in the kitchen, and the kids in the kitchen have their next program next week. I want to ask you in a second to tell us what that program is. One second. <laughs> uh, a little garnish would be nice. So you can add a little bit of um, greens if you'd like. This is arugula. So tell us what your program is next week. You're a kid in the kitchen. What are you guys doing Saturday at 1230 Eastern time? We're going to have, we're going to be talking with Genesis Butler, who is a, uh, she's a child and she is a very strong activist for veganism. She's, I think, 12, no, she's 14. And she's the youngest person to do a TEDx talk. What's it like? Very good. Yeah, you taste the ginger and everything? Yeah. Great. So a couple, couple final hints and then we'll move on is if you want a darker color, put some red bell pepper that adds more redness. Uh, I love lemon and um, this is a Meyer lemon. If you're lucky enough to be able to find, this is a biodynamic organic Meyer lemon. These taste great. A little bit of lemon is good. And if you don't want to use cashews, you can use tofu, for example, silken tofu to thicken the soup. And that's it. It's my easy, easy carrot ginger soup. I hope you'll try it. And with that, I'm going to pass the uh, baton on to Karen Osborne, my colleague in Austin, Texas. She's going to be making a lucky New Year's stew. Take it away, Karen. Thank you, Philip. Yes, we need a lucky stew. Okay. Um, so welcome to my kitchen in Austin, Texas. And Happy New Year. What I'm going to show you is a lucky New Year oh. stew, which I think we should be eating all year long. Uh, especially this year. Um, so I don't know, so there's a ton of different stories about eating black eyed peas and collard greens on New Year's for luck or prosperity. Um, some of them say that the black eyed peas uh, represent the coins and the collard greens represent folded money. Some say the collard greens represent the money and black eyed peas represent wealth and then they expand as you cook them. But whatever the story is, this dish is going to bring you wealth because health is wealth. And this dish is so easy. Um, you can serve it as a side on your fancy New Year's feast, or it's a meal in a bowl all the rest of the year. So let's get started. It's just, uh, it's the same. I'm going to be making it in the instant pot, but you can also make it in a, a pot on your stove. And it's, it's almost exactly the same. Oh go over the differences as we get them. So uh, I'm going to lower my screen so you can see my cutting board. But first, I'm just going to add, basically, all this recipe is is adding things to the pot. And so I'm adding my black eyed peas. And they are um, a good source of fiber and protein. It helps your digestive system. It's uh, also got phosphorus, magnesium, and zinc, which is great for your bones. The fiber keeps you feeling full longer, and um, it's just all around good, uh, good nutrition. Uh, so I have it soaked. You don't have to soak black eyed peas, and they cook about the same amount of time to make them nice and soft, but soaking them makes them more digestible. And then the next thing I'm going to add is um, oat groats. So this is the least processed form of oats. Um, you could use rice or any other grain that you desire, but I like the texture that the oat groats add to my stew. Um, oats have a fiber called beta-glucans, which also um, helps lower cholesterol and um, blood sugar, and it actually feeds the good bacteria in your digestive tract. 
Um, and then the next thing I'm going to add is the water because the oats and the beans need the water, need, you know, need to be in the water to cook. So that's, that's the only thing that you have to do in order. So in the Instant Pot, I'm using two and a half cups of water. If I was doing it on the stove, I'd use four cups of water because it, you cook longer and the steam escapes. All right, so the next thing we're going to do is uh, add some onions. So I've chopped an onion and uh, I love the taste of uh, sauteed onions first, but I wanted the texture of this, uh, just the way it is gives it a nice uh, thicker stew and creamier texture. So I will be adding some onion powder when I put my spices in to kick up that onion flavor. And the onions have a, uh, onions and garlic, we'll put the garlic in, we have a sulfur, sulfur compound that um, actually help you absorb the lycopene from tomatoes. So onions and tomatoes, this was a pound of tomatoes, Onions and tomatoes are really good together. And lycopene actually can help you help protect your skin from uh, sunburn. And it can also, it's good for your heart health. It's good for a whole lot of things, but also can help you um, actually protect you a little bit from some environmental toxins too. So I've uh, put all that in there. The last food I'm going to put in is the collard greens. And what I did already, is uh, remove the, the leaf from the stem. So you can take a knife down either side or just pull it. And you wanna save that stem. There's a lot of nutrients in the stem. And then I just, I did a whole bunch of collard greens. You could use two. So collard greens are a really good uh, source of calcium and plant-based calcium is a lot more bioavailable than um, dairy and I, I did this to one of the leaves um, and got over a cup of collard greens so that was um, like this whole thing like maybe one leaf would be about 10 percent of your uh, at least 10 percent of your daily recommended allowance of calcium um, so I'm just going to put the chopped leaves in there and the stem, you know, lots of minerals in the stem. You don't want to waste it. So I'm just going to chop it up and you could hold half of it back. Uh, so collards are cruciferous vegetables. Um, if you, I'm going to put them, put them all in. I'll tell you something else you can do. Uh, but if you, if you hold half of it back, the, uh, the cruciferous vegetables have a, an enzyme and a precursor that combine when you chew it or cut it. Uh, and they make sulforaphane, which is a great antioxidant that uh, is cancer protective and uh, just, it also helps um, keep H. pylori from attaching to the uh, cell wall of your uh, stomach. And so, uh, I mean, you want that, if you cook it, the enzyme is damaged by the heat, but the, the precursor is not and the sulforaphane is not. So I could hold some of these little bits back, but I like the texture of it. That's why I'm putting it in there. Then after I cook the soup, um, just put it on. And when you eat the fresh collard with the cooked collard, it makes that sulforaphane. But another thing you can do, since I want to cook it all, is sprinkle a little bit of mustard powder on there after it's cooked. And that has the enzyme and, cause that's a cruciferous vegetable too. And, um, and then that will create the sulforaphane. So all I'm gonna do is add my spices. Like I said, I had onion powder. Uh, I have some uh, rosemary, oh no, not rosemary, sorry. Uh, oregano, it's antiviral, antibacterial. I have coriander, thyme, uh, and the smoked paprika, that's important. All this is just for great flavor. Um, and if you make it once like this and decide you want more flavor, put more of those spices in there. If you don't like these spices, you can put a different, different uh, combination of spices. I've also got a little bit of cayenne because I like the kick. Then you can put as much or as little as you want. 
I'm just going to put it in the uh, Instant Pot and cook it for 25 minutes. And if I was going to cook it on the stove, you know, I would add the four cups of water instead of the two and a half and bring it to a boil and then um, simmer it with lid on for about an hour and a half until the beans and the oats are nice and soft. And it is a stew or soup, so you get all the nutrients that leach out of the vegetables when you're cooking um, because you're consuming the liquid too. So I have made some in advance and I've made a topping. This is totally optional. I was also going to mention about the salt. Um, if you want, you can salt the whole dish when, when you're done cooking it. Like when you cook with salt, the salt kind of disappears and you tend to put more salt, get more sodium. So um, you just salt the food as you eat it. You can either salt the whole dish or salt your own uh, bowl. And then I've made an optional topping, which uh, is kind of like a sour cream-ish topping. It's uh, I've steamed parsnip and uh, potato. And, you can, and I have a little hemp seeds in there, um, lemon juice, garlic granules, and salt. You can see how thick and creamy it is. And I'm just gonna dollop a little bit on top. But that's totally optional. It's good without it. Um, just adds another kick of flavor. And there we have a bone supportive, heart supportive, um, digestive system supportive. It's just a total all around healthy one meal in a bowl. And it's delicious. And I, <laughs> I think we should all eat this all year long this year. So again, Happy New Year, and now we're going to Montgomery, Alabama with Carolyn Strickland. Hi, thanks, Karen. That looks delicious. Um, I make a New Year's Eve stew that's pretty similar to that. Love collard greens. They're so good for you. Um, so I'm going to have to give yours a try. So what I'm making today is something that we call at our house our favorite winter stew, but I think you could also technically call it Three Sisters stew from the Native American legend of the Three Sisters, which would be squash, corn, and beans. So um, we're going to start with an optional ingredient. The optional ingredient is a vegan sausage. You do not have to use it, okay? So, but I know that there are a lot of people out there who are trying to transition to eating a vegan diet or a whole food plant-based diet. Um, some people don't need to feel like they're eating meat, but if you were one of those people that's having a hard time and wants to feed your husband possibly who won't come on board with you, you know, because he wants to eat meat, this tastes meaty and this specific brand that I'm using today is actually not, not too bad for you. Um, so field roast plant-based uh, sausage. This one is smoked apple sage and I'll talk more about it in just a minute. But what you're gonna start by doing is just using two of them, not the whole package, but the package looks like this and they've just repackaged it. So it used to look a little different than this. I find it in the produce section at my grocery store, um, Publix here, and then Whole Foods also has it. So at Publix it's in the produce section, at Whole Foods it's in the refrigerator case marked vegan. So you might have to look in different places to find it. Um, I've already gone ahead and cooked two of the sausages. So you're gonna wanna remove them from the casing. They're in a plastic casing that you have to pull off. So, which, you know, is better than like sausage that is made out of pork <laughs> because that one is in a casing that is um, something you probably don't even wanna know what that is, but um, I think it's like intestines or something. So um, yeah, don't, don't do that. So this is in a plastic casing and you're just gonna chop it up. You can crumble it or chop it up into little half moons and then cook it in a skillet with just a little bit of water with it. And I've already gone ahead and cooked it up and then set it aside. So our next ingredient is going to be one whole onion. This is one whole organic yellow onion and then two cloves of garlic. The recipes are actually all on our Facebook page. Um, I've already seen a few questions today about where can I find the recipes. So if you go to the So Many Cooks in the Kitchen Facebook page, there is actually a post that just went up a few hours ago that has a link to all the recipes. So you'll be able to find that now and also after, after the show. So one whole onion, I'm gonna put that in here. 
and cook it with um, a little bit of, you could use broth, you could use water, but you do not need oil to cook onions. So we'll get that cooking pretty quickly here. So while that's cooking, and that's gonna cook for just a little bit, and then we'll be adding some other ingredients. Um, I wanted to talk quickly about why we call it our favorite winter stew. Um, I saw a recipe similar to this one several years ago before we were actually plant-based and we've been plant-based almost 12 years, but so several years ago we saw a recipe and where there's a local cooking competition that we used to have here in town called the Physician's Feast. And it was doctors and their spouses in a cooking competition. And so I actually made this recipe and brought it to the competition and won first place for soups and stews, that category. So it is really good. And it was made for several years at the um, local uh, place where the competition was held. It was a restaurant. And I think they actually used meat in it, but Anyway, um, so, but it's a, it's a delicious recipe. Um, the three sisters refers, like I said, to corn, beans, and squash because Native American legend has it that those three um, plants grow beautifully together and they do. So you could use any kind of squash. Today I'm using butternut squash. You could also use acorn squash, kaboka squash, um, you know, any of the hard winter squashes. Um, I probably wouldn't use like a, you could, I suppose, use yellow squash in the summertime, but we're using a hard, a hard winter squash. Um, and in this case, with butternut squash, you want to go ahead and peel it. So I've already, and it's about five cups of hard butternut squash and in pretty big chunks too. So because you don't want it to disappear completely in the stew. So if you made little tiny pieces, they're going to disappear. So if you have really big chunks of it, then they will stay pretty chunky. You'll still get some puree out of it, but you know it's, it's nice to have some chunks of, of uh, butternut squash in your stew. So while this is cooking, I want to talk a little bit more about the sausage. And this is just gonna cook for a little bit until they soften up. But with the, with the sausage, you're going to, like I said, either crumble it, so you could just pull it apart. You could chop it up into little half moons. Um, the ingredients in this one are, so if you, if you have celiac disease or are very gluten sensitive, you can't eat that. And you could totally leave it out of this recipe. It's not a necessary ingredient, it is optional. But it has um, Yukon gold potatoes, apples, uh, rubbed sage, it's, and then of course, gluten, vital wheat gluten. So it is delicious and very meaty and it has that mouthfeel of meat. So if you have a family member who is totally missing meat, um, you know, it's a good, it's a good thing to have. So, okay, so I'm gonna add just a little bit more water to it. And let that cook. Okay, so now that that's kind of softened up, what we're gonna do, is add some vegetable broth so and some and the squash so we'll go ahead and add five cups and it's a it's about a medium butternut squash so and then when you cut it up it's about five cups worth okay so and my husband cut that all up and he's standing over here wanting credit for that so <laughs> he cut it all up and then we're going to add a half a teaspoon of marjoram so marjoram is actually a subspecies of the oregano family that Karen was talking about just a little while ago. Um, and both of those are actually relatives of, you know, they're in the mint family, but lots and lots of antioxidants. Um, we recommend eating a lot of herbs and spices. They're all quite good for you. Okay, so we've added the squash and the marjoram and then two cups of vegetable broth. You could use a homemade vegetable broth. You could use a store-bought low-sodium vegetable broth. Um, and I am using a better than bouillon, no chicken flavored broth, which I use way less um, of, the, of the paste in it than it calls for. So it calls for one teaspoon per a cup. And that actually gives you an awful lot of salt. So I cut way down on that. You, like I said, you can also use your own homemade broth, but go with a low sodium broth. And that's gonna cook for about 15 to 20 minutes until that gets soft. So luckily through the magic of TV, I have already done that. <laughs> so we have, it's already cooked. 
So you can see that it's softened up very nicely and you could go ahead and smash a few of the pieces of the butternut squash against the side of the pot. You wanna make it nice and creamy. And then we're going to add one cup of corn. I have organic frozen corn and one and a half cups of beans. What I'm using today is cannellini beans, organic cannellini beans. You could also use pinto beans, um, great northern beans, navy beans, your favorite bean in here, but something light colored because it is a really pretty orange stew. So you don't want to really disrupt that with like bright red kidney beans or something. So it's a really pretty stew. And then the thing that, oh, and the, and of course the sausage, if you want that, the optional ingredient. And then the thing that I think really kicks off the flavor quite beautifully is one tablespoon of molasses. And today I'm using an organic black strap molasses. And it's just one tablespoon. And it adds a delicious flavor that just somehow reminds me of going camping. I don't know why, but there's something about, it's just a nice, um, homey, warm flavor. So that one tablespoon of molasses mixed in and then you just wanna let it cook for another five minutes or so just to get the flavors to marry. And this is one of those, one of those stews that's actually even better the next day. So, and then what I do is serve it with some fresh cracked black pepper and then a pinch of fresh chopped parsley on top, just as a little garnish. It's just beautiful. You could also serve it with a big green salad next to it. If you want some rice to throw in there, you could do that too and make it go a little farther. But it's just a delicious, homey, very warming stew. So I hope you'll give it a try. It's the Three Sisters stew, or as we call it around here, our favorite winter stew. And now I'm going to send you to Calamandrana, Italy. And John and Orhun will be making pasta e fagioli. And I hope I said that right. I think that means pasta with beans. Is that right, John? And you sure did, Carolyn. Thank you. Awesome. Your soup sounds wonderful. I'm going to have to try that. Um, hi, everybody, and welcome to my kitchen in Calamandrana, Italy. Um, this evening, I will share with you an um, Italian classic, a much loved um, and very traditional um, soup stew from this region and pretty much every region in Italy has their own version. And having said that, I'm pretty sure in every family they prepare it differently too. This is pasta e fagioli and it's as Italian as um, apple pies to us Americans. Um, so this really humble um, food, and I started it uh, because I wanted to share with you how it's done. I, I have to keep stirring it every now and then. I'll um, share with you the ingredients. As you see, there's not too much here. Well, maybe it looks crowded, but um, the main ingredients are pasta and beans. And for this soup, um, the locals here traditionally use bordotti beans. They are these lovely um, red and speckled um, beans. They're not so big, they're smallish. And then um, these beans, I cook them at home in a pressure cooker, um, in a traditional one. I don't have a new modern thing. Um, but you can also, of course, always buy already cooked ones. Uh, so the important thing to remember is that when you cook it yourself, you also have a lot of um, cooking liquids that you could use for the soup. So if you've bought um, already cooked canned beans, please have aside about a quart of um, vegetable broth ready so that you can get the soup um, going. So if you're going to cook them at home and you have your dry beans, then you need to soak them overnight. So this soup, uh, you need to think uh, a day ahead. Um, you soak them overnight. The next day you discard the soaking water because the soaking water contains chemicals that um, give you bloating and uh, discomfort and gas. Therefore you discard it. However, the cooking liquids you keep. So they're very important. The um, other uh, ingredients in the soup are celery, carrots and um, onions and garlic. 
And the celery, carrots, and onion make up what they call sofrito here. And for this soup, um, all you need is a small carrot. It's about an ounce. Um, and one stick of celery, again, about an ounce. And you need about, um, you have this much of an onion. You pretty much need half of it. That's about an ounce as well. And then you also need some herbs, a sprig of um, rosemary, a couple of leaves of uh, bay leaves and the garlic. And um, for later, you um, can sprinkle some chili peppers on it or something. The beans on, in the soup need to be small pieces. Um, I have a mezze penne and they are whole grain, but you can use any shape little pasta you wish. Um, there's also tomato paste, passata, and you have about um, roughly a cup and a half or so of this um, in the recipe as well. Of course, salt and pepper. First, you start by cooking your beans, and then you um, use the chopped uh, garlic, onion, and carrots. And you can finely chop them by hand or use one of these gizmos to put them all together. And in a second, you have them all very finely chopped, which I did. And then you saute them. You saute them, taking care that they get nice and golden brown, but not burnt. Once they're nicely cooked, you add your chopped garlic and you give it another minute or two and cook it that way. Once they're cooked, you put your cooked beans in without the liquid and you cook everything together to give them, you know, help them get their taste um, mixed or blended into each other. And once the beans and the sofrito mix has cooked together a little bit, you add your um, tomato paste. The tomato paste, um, you cook um, this mixture for about 15 minutes. But about the, at that time, you add some liquids from the um, cooking liquids of the beans to adjust the thickness of the soup so it doesn't stick to the bottom and it still has some substance, but it's still more liquid. Now, before um, I, I started, I put the, um, the beans in, I mean the beans, the pasta in, so they're already cooked. Maybe you can see here. Um, and then, but the soup is not done. I had told you to take a little bit of the mixture out. You take it out, and if, this is before you put the pasta in, but these are all in the instructions in the recipe booklet. So if you're confused, refer back to the recipe booklet online. So using an immersion blender, pre-pasta, you take some of the soup mixture and you blend it. Once the pasta is cooked, you add the nice, smooshed up version of the uh, of the soup. So you see how thick this is. This all goes into the soup to give it even more body and thickness. The locals here like it really thick. I mean, I don't know. Um, there used to be an advertisement when I was young. It used to be, I think it was called Dinty More or something. It's a soup that eats like a meal. So it's really thick here, at least in this part of the country. So now I have my uh, pureed mixture in too. And I give it a stir. And it's really nice and thick. At this time, I add my chopped rosemary in as well, and it's really finely chopped. And I give it another stir. And now's the time to give it a taste test as well. Mm. Mm. Nice, but needs a little bit of salt and a little bit of pepper. So here we are, the soup is ready, but Tradition says that when you get to this stage and everything is ready and mixed, 
you close it and let it rest a bit, a few minutes. While the soup is resting, I'll tell you all about the nutritional value about this humble soup. So our humble beans are of course full of protein and fiber, which goes into our soup. The carrots and the celery contain a lot of vitamin A and vitamin A gives us antioxidants. Antioxidants are good for fighting free radicals. Free radicals in our body are the ones that cause troubles. They are the precursors, well not precursors, but they cause um, illnesses. Therefore, it's good to have um, vitamin A. Celery also contains vitamin K, and even just a stick like this may have your 70% of your daily requirement. This soup, together with all these ingredients, also gives you a lot of minerals. Um, calcium, much needed for bones. Um, uh, Potassium, zinc, selenium, all good for an immune system. And especially in the winter, we need all these because we need to keep our immune system strong. And hey, also in our region, the locals eat the soup in the summer. It was a uh, tradition here and it was a transition for me. So, but I've learned to like it and eat it in the summer as well. And during the COVID times, um, who doesn't need a very nutritious soup? And so it's rested. I'll give it another um, stir. And I'd like to show you what it looks like. It's really nice and thick. Um, look at this. It's a wonderful, healthy, amazing soup. And I like to put a little bit of chili flakes on it. And a little bit of also um, cashew parmigiano. There you are. This is a vegan pasta e fagioli from the Piedmont region. And remember, this is something you ought to try at home. And before I leave, I'd like to introduce to you my colleague, Stacy Heine from Noblesville, Indiana. Arrivederci. And take it away, Stacy. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. I love pasta y fagioli. It is one of my favorite soups. And I had it years ago. And there's so many ways that you can cook it, which I love about that soup. You can put all different types of pastas in there. And it's just so good. So thank you so much. Um, today, I'm going to be sharing a black bean soup with you. And this is my, what I call the best black bean soup because it's so easy and it's so delicious and so warming in the winter. So what I have here in my skillet is basically the beginning of a good soup for any soup that you're making. Pretty much, you always need onions, you need garlic, typically celery or fennel and carrots, usually a root vegetable to add flavor to the beginning of your soups. So I have carrot, celery, you can use fennel bulb instead of celery if you'd like. Um, I've got garlic and I've got yellow onion. I also just added, I added the garlic at the end. I wanted to give you a little, little tip there. I hope I damaged yourself. Um, cooking and garlic. I want to encourage you to chop your garlic first and then let it sit there for maybe five to 10 minutes. What that's going to do is let the really beneficial sulfur compounds release and the enzymes are there and more bioavailable for your body to um, absorb. So it's called the chop and stop method. And um, so try doing that when you're cooking that. So I have these sauteed. What I've done is sauteed these in a little bit of water. You can always saute in vegetable broth if you want more layers of flavor. Um, but instead of having to saute in oil, those are two really good options for you to keep your heart healthy. So now that I have that done, I'm going to basically wop my dish over here for a pot of reduced this is reduced vegetable broth. Now, my favorite vegetable broth is a low sodium vegetable broth. This is actually from Engine 2. 
and um, from Rip Esselstyn. This is a low sodium broth and that has tons of flavor and I've reduced it down in half. Now on the recipe, you'll see that we'll add the beans and we'll reduce it down, but that takes a half hour. So for um, purposes of the video, I've already done the reduction of the broth down to about two cups. I just use the entire canister, which is four cups. Then I'm going to add, oops, I need to add the rest of my spices to my skillet first before I um, add them to my, my broth. I'm adding cumin. Cumin is one of the most earthy spices that you can use. And honestly, I can't get enough. So this recipe calls for one to two tablespoons of cumin, of ground cumin. Um, but I love, I love the two tablespoons. It really lends great flavor. And then I'm also adding smoked paprika and some uh, crushed red pepper. You can totally skip the crushed red pepper if you're giving this to young children and they, you know, don't have any, any desire to eat spicy food at all. Um, but the smoked paprika, I will say, does lend a very good flavor compared to just your regular paprika. So if you can get your hands on smoked paprika, go for that. All right, so now I'm just gonna go ahead and add the vegetables into my broth, into my reduced broth. I cook these vegetables down so that they are still a little bit al dente, if you will. They still have a little bit of texture to them so they're not too mushy. And then I just need to add my black beans. They are the star of the show. So this is a black bean soup. When I originally had black bean soup, it was just pretty much pureed. I think it was Campbell's out of the can. <laughs> but this is a kind of like a chunky puree. So it's a nice hybrid. Um, and beans are the ultimate longevity food. Beans are eaten around the world by all of the longest living people. So if you know anything about the blue zones, you know about beans. And there are so many varieties of beans that you can eat a different bean every single day of the year and not repeat it one time. So there is so much variety when it comes to beans. You could even use different beans in this soup and it would probably be so delicious. So the way that I cooked my beans is in the pressure cooker, but this recipe calls for four cans of beans. Once you drain your cans of beans, it comes out to about one and a half cups of beans. So I'm going to use my pressure cooked beans and just measure out about four cups. If I can add rate, that would actually be six. <laughs> so I like cooking my beans with, um, these are heaping cups. I like cooking my beans with bay leaves. It adds a lot of flavor. And I just found the bay leaf. So I think it's the perfect amount. I'm just gonna add them in. And then you just give it a good stir. So at this rate, if you're using canned beans and they're not already really, really, really soft, this is the time that you can cook and reduce your broth alongside your beans so that everything gets really, really soft. But since I've already cooked my beans in a pressure cooker and they're very, very, um, very, very well cooked and my broth is very reduced, I'm good to go for the last step. So this again comes together quite quickly once you have all your ingredients in place. The last step is to use your immersion blender. Now listen, if you don't have an immersion blender, it's totally okay. You can even use a potato masher and still get a great result. You can use a, um, a Vitamix or a high-speed blender as well. Um, what you would do is take half of this soup and put half of it into the blender until it's pureed and then reincorporate it into the chunky, the chunky soup. So it's, it has good texture still. Or you can use your immersion blender and just uh, blend it till it's about halfway blended. <laughs> Okay, so the texture is not quite a puree, but still has great, great 
mouthfeel to it. And you can serve this up as a full meal, which I suggest doing because it is a bean soup. It has all of the groups on the power plate, which is what we teach about, aside from a grain. So if you wanna have like a whole wheat sourdough bread alongside this, it would be delicious. And then I'm just gonna add cilantro to the top of it, which has bacterial and illness fighting compounds in it. And it really adds the most delicious flavor. To really up level your soup, add a little bit of lime to it. And there you are, that's the best black bean soup. Enjoy. We're gonna now kick it over to Kobe Stubby in Omaha. Thank you. Hi everybody. And thank you, Stacy. Your black bean soup looks delicious. I love black bean soup and it's so much fun and so easy to make. And you did a great demonstration with that. So thank you so much. So welcome everybody to my home in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, I'm Cody Stubby. I'm a food for life instructor and a registered nurse. And this is my lovely middle daughter, Ella, and she's actually on one of our So Many Kids in the Kitchen, which we have an event coming up next Saturday, so I hope you can join us for that. So you want to say hi? Hi. <laughs> anyway, so she's going to help me today. I'm so lucky to have her, and what's, what's great is that this is one of our favorite little recipes. I'm going to make chili, and this is a really fun recipe because it's, like I said, it's, it's easy. Ella likes to help me make it and it's delicious and it's very customizable. So what I'm gonna show you today is just kind of like my basic chili soup and um, just kind of talk about how you could customize it to your own liking. So what I have as a recipe that's provided, it's a guideline, it's kind of like your base chili soup and you can, like I said, add to it or you can take stuff away from it too, it's totally fine. So. Um, and I grew up with this recipe. My mom taught me how to make chili. And so I'm teaching Ella how to make chili. Um, the thing is, is that I've changed it a little bit since growing up because, um, you know, I, I didn't grow up as a, a vegan. And it was only about four years ago when I went whole food plant based. So I am, um, you know, excited to share this vegan recipe with you. It's whole food plant based, it's healthy for you. Um, and it's, it's filling, right? It's great in these cold winter months because we live in Omaha and we still have some snow on the ground right now. So this is something to kind of help warm you up, right, Ella? Yeah. Yeah, so, all right, well, let's get to it. So what we're gonna do first is I have just a skillet here and I'm gonna get about one onion chopped up. I already have it done here. I'm gonna turn on my stove top and we have to be really careful not to touch the stove top, right, Ella? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I have a gas one here, so you probably heard it clicking. All right. So we're going to get the onion going here. And I have about three cloves of garlic that I've minced. Now, if you like garlic, you want to add in a couple more cloves, that's totally fine. Or if you're not a garlic fan, just leave it out. Okay. Or if you don't have fresh garlic, what you could do is do some um, garlic powder. That works pretty well too. Okay, so now I'm sure a lot of you have probably seen us do some water sauteing. So basically it means that we don't use any oil. And if you do have a pan that does like really need something to keep things from sticking, you could just do a very light spray of um, a spray oil. Or what we like to do and teach you guys is how to just add a little bit of like filtered water to it to keep it from sticking. So I'm gonna add a little bit of that in here. Okay, so I'm not gonna show you the whole time period that this is gonna take to cook, but you wanna cook it until your onions are cooked through. So they're kind of uh, a little bit clear, right, Ella? Yeah. A little bit translucent. Oh, I got another little one. Can you say hi? Mm -hmm. This is Nora. This is my, my littlest one. And she's on the So Many Kids in the Kitchen too. What a nice surprise to have you down here. So she also likes to help cook. Um, sometimes she likes to eat our ingredients or hide them as well. So you just, you just never know what she's gonna do sometimes. All right, so you can see it's kind of bubbling here and that's, that's great. Um, like I said, when these get kind of clear, I'm gonna add in my next ingredient, which is gonna be about five stalks of chopped celery. I don't know if a lot of you guys are used to cooking with celery, but don't be scared of it. It's actually really easy. You just take the stalks and you rinse them and then you, you chop off both ends and then I stack them up and just chop them. All right, so I'm gonna put that in. 
Okay, now I would probably cover this and you just want like your celery to get fork tender. Okay, and then that would be done. And then we would start adding in our seasonings. So for today, I'm just gonna set this aside and show you one that I've actually already cooked up. And these ones, I think my celery got just a little bit overcooked in it. So I had to step away for a minute. Um, but, so it's gonna be, you'll see the onions are a little bit kind of clear. I'm gonna add my seasonings. So what we have here, i look at my recipe, make sure I tell you correctly here. I got one teaspoon of paprika. And I don't know if you guys have ever tried smoked paprika, but oh my gosh, smoked paprika is delicious. All right, and then I got chili powder because chili wouldn't be chili without chili powder, right? She's stuffing stuff in my back pocket. All right, so I got about one and a half tablespoons of chili powder. So I'm gonna add that in here as well. All right, looks like Ella's got some things. What do you have here, do you know? What's that look like? Oregano? Yeah, like oregano? It yep, it, it doesn't say on there. I didn't write on it. I got about one teaspoon of oregano. So you can use fresh um, oregano or dried oregano. You can use powder if you want. It doesn't matter. Now don't smell this, but I bet you can guess what that is. Pepper? Yep, I got some black pepper here. Okay, so I got about a half a teaspoon. And my kids don't like it really spicy, but we do like some seasoning because it really makes it delicious. All right, I bet you can guess what that is. Cumin? Yep, that is, that is cumin. Way to go, high five. Yeah, high five. Mm -hmm. Oh, braid it? Okay, I'll braid her hair later. No, okay. not braid it, unbraid Oh, unbraid it, okay, I'll do that later. All right, so I got some mommy duties calling here pretty soon. Um, I got two teaspoons of cumin, so I'm gonna put that in there. Okay, now my burner would be on, I'd just be stirring this in. Now, usually when I have this going and my onions are water sauteing and my garlic and my celery, I would already be having uh, my other ingredients in my pot going so they get hot. And what I have in there is you uh, about 46 fluid ounces of either tomato juice or vegetable juice. Now what I do is I kind of shake this up because some of that good stuff kind of settles in the bottom. So I make sure the lid's still on tight and I shake it up. And I'm gonna put that in here. Now I'm gonna turn this on so I want to make sure you stay back, okay? Okay, there we go. All right. Now some people, um, you know, don't use anything, any kind of juice, but I always grew up doing it this way. And what's great about it is that it just kind of gives a little more, um, oh, I don't know, just more sus sustenance, sustenance, whatever you want to call it, um, besides just adding like water or broth to this. It makes it just a little bit thicker, and I really like that. So Ella's going to be doing some stirring for me here in just a minute, right, Ella? Yeah. So now I got a can of diced tomatoes. Now there's different kinds of diced tomatoes. It doesn't matter. It's just totally your preference. Um, I've used um, fire roasted tomatoes and those are delicious. I've used some that already have some seasonings in it. Like some already have like onion and garlic in it. And if they do, you may not have to add as much of your own garlic and onion to begin with, okay? So these ones are just plain diced tomatoes. Not to slop out on you, okay? All right, so we got that. You got your stir. Let me get some beans in here first, okay. So now what I have here are some pinto beans. I have two cans. Now you can do plain uh, pinto beans. Um, you can make all these beans yourself and that is totally fine. So when I have it down as one can, one can equals about one and a half cups of beans. So I'm gonna go ahead and just dump this in. There's two cans and these ones actually have some chili powder already in them. So I only did one and a half a tablespoons of chili powder in here. If I didn't have that with the pre-seasoned beans, I'd probably do it up to two tablespoons of chili powder. Okay. Now I have some black beans here. I love black beans, right, Ellie? You love black beans too. I love do you love black beans, beans Nora? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's see. I have, oh, I got a lot here. My soup's going to get full, full. All right. I got about three cans of black beans. And um, if you get low or no sodium black beans, 
You can leave the juice in if you want. I tend to rinse them off, or if I know that I um, just have regular can where that could have the sodium in there, I always make sure and drain and rinse those beans off because you don't need that extra sodium in your diet. Okay, and then I got kidney beans. You want kidney beans? Oh, you want one? Sure. Okay. And we've all washed our hands before we did all this. Nora, you want a kidney bean? Not, really Not right now? Okay. All right. So can you gently stir that vanilla? Now we have, remember, it's kind of hot here. So just very gently. Kind of get it in there a little bit. Just keep it back, honey. I will in just a minute. Yep, that's perfect. Okay. So now I'm going to add in my other ingredients. Very carefully, I'm trying not to slop it on you, honey. Luckily, it's not hot yet. Um, I usually do this in a bigger pot, but I really want to make sure that you could actually see in here and see what I was making today. All right, do you mind if I help you with that? That look good? Oh, that looks yummy. You can see the seasonings in there. Now, um, one thing about me and my um, background is that I'm a cardiac nurse. I used to help out with open heart surgery and I did that for about eight years. And the last 11 years I've been a nursing instructor and I see a lot of patients that have iron deficiency anemia. And one thing I love about this is that it's great for your heart. It's great to help with um, preventing um, the iron deficiency because you have a lot of vitamin C from the tomatoes right? And you got a lot of iron from your beans. And it's really good to combine the two because that vitamin C will help with the iron absorption. Um, so this has both of those qualities to it. Plus it's got a lot of vitamins and minerals otherwise. And it's got a lot of potassium. So as you know, potassium naturally helps keep that blood pressure low or lowers it if it is high. So that's pretty awesome, right? All right, Ella, you want to give it a try? Yeah. Okay. Really good. Is that good? All right. Awesome. So um, you can add in other things to this. Sometimes I just want to add in like a can of sweet corn to it. I just drain the sweet corn, add it to it. It's pretty easy. And then, um, and sometimes instead of uh, diced tomatoes, maybe I'll do like a cup of salsa to it. And we can add in cooked quinoa. That's pretty awesome. So, you know, quinoa is almost a complete protein. So that works really well. And let's see, what else do we do? We add in lentils and <laughs> um, on top, you can add in like chopped avocado. You can add in, um, you know, whole wheat crackers on top. You can cut up some uh, whole wheat tortilla and kind of roast those and season them and sprinkle those on top. It's just delicious. So there's all sorts of ways that you can just tweak this to make it your own. If you um, allow yourself some vegan cheese, that's another option. You could just sprinkle a little bit on top as well. So lots of options, super easy, delicious, right, Ella? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Thanks for helping me today. It's just so awesome to have you here. Um, anyway, if you have any questions, please feel free to post those. And um, thanks for watching. I'm going to pass it over to Denise, Pierrot, and Scotland. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Greetings from Scotland. Um, if I don't sound Scottish, it's because I'm American. And um, I recently moved here. I've been here about a month. And I moved from the Netherlands, where I lived for 10 years. So in honor of living in Scotland, I'm going to make a national dish of the UK, which is curry, because that's what folks love here. And I personally love it. Now, we won't get this recipe probably to fruition because it takes about 40 minutes to really get it to cook. And I really wanted to talk about the first steps of the recipe. So I've noticed today, lots of folks are using cumin and I'm gonna use it as well, but I'm gonna use cumin seeds. If you've never used them, they're terrific. They're really earthy. Um, they just have a lovely smell. And when you start to toast them, they taste even better. So what I'm going to do, I've heated this up a little bit. We'll see how that works. I'm going to put about two, two teaspoons just of cumin seeds in. Now, if you don't have cumin seeds, you can always use ground cumin. Skip the roasting step, though. For this particular curry, it's a kidney bean curry. I'm going to actually take a few um, bay leaves. I'm going to add those into the toasting. 
And the other thing I'm gonna add, and I don't know if you've ever seen these before or not, but these are fenugreek seeds, very, very ancient spice. If you've ever bought curry powder, uh, regular old curry powder, you probably smelt it. I don't know, it has a really sweet smell. Some folks say it's a little mustardy, I don't think so, but I'm gonna give this a little toast. One of the things I learned when I started to really get serious about plant-based eating several years ago and really deal with the with not having oil or cooking with oil, I started learning about flavors. And so what I really wanna talk about is just these beginning steps of kind of building flavors. I've got this little warm. These little guys are just starting to look just a little toasty brown. My kitchen, I wish you could smell it because it's starting to smell like curry. So the next thing I'm gonna do, because now I know my pan is hot and I'm gonna add my onions. Now, why did I stress now I know my pan is hot? Because if you're not cooking with oil, one of your secret weapons is not adding them ever to a cold pan. Always let your pan heat up. I'm going to also at the same time add jalapenos. The jalapenos are gonna have a little bit of moisture just enough so that my onions aren't gonna to stick to the pan anyway. But what happens if you've ever noticed, if you add out onions and all sorts of things and then you turn the pan on the stove and you don't have any oil and what happens? Well, it's happened to me. The onions just sort of like disintegrate into the pan. So make sure if you're struggling with that, um, you always start with a medium hot pan on almost every recipe that I that I do or I publish on my website, I always start with this step. So that's one of the things. So we're gonna build flavor. We started with the first level, that was the seeds. Now we're adding to that little onion, little jalapeno. I did two jalapenos because we really like spicy curry. If you don't, um, add one. And seriously, folks, I didn't de-seed the, the, the jalapeno. I didn't take out the core. That's the hot stuff. So you can pretty well do uh, what you need to. Once I've got that going, here's gonna come another really quick layer. I'm gonna do some garlic. Okay, here's truth time. That's six cloves of garlic pressed. I know what you're thinking, but this is curry. This is ginger. It's about two inches of ginger stock. It's peeled, it's diced. I'm gonna add that in. It's starting to smell really good in here now. Very curry. It's cooking along here. And now because it's curry and we're not using curry powder because we don't do that. That's just a British invention. It's not Indian anyway. Um, I'm gonna use a combination of a few other spices. I'm gonna show you this last kind of step before we get to the kidney beans because this is actually a pretty quick recipe. One of the things we're doing though is we're starting to let things go together. We're taking our time with her. We're letting everybody have a show. We're letting the spice, the first level of spices have a little bit of their time. And then the onion and jalapeno. I can see now my onion, it's like super releasing all the moisture. It's not sticking at all to this pan. And this is a cast iron pan, so it probably should, but it doesn't. And then I'm gonna add some, four more spices. I know, it's crazy. I'm gonna add turmeric. So pardon me, some of these are in Dutch because we've just moved and I brought lots of spices. Uh, but this is turmeric. It's that great kind of orangey spice. If you've never seen it, if you've seen curry powder, that's what gives the curry powder um, its color. It's got a real kind of another earthy flavor. So I can't really quite describe turmeric, but um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of discussion about medicinal purposes. This is ground turmeric and it's a pretty big tub. So I don't know how medicinal it is, but it's very tasty. I'm adding in some cayenne pepper in a minute. Got it all mixed here in this dish, by the way. I'm adding in also some um, ground coriander. Uh, Gemel in, in Dutch means ground. So that's where we've come from. And coriander's got a very particular flavor. It's not cumin at all. So don't, don't get those mixed up. Uh, and then I'm ordering, I'm going to add a spice, a garam masala spice. Now, I know some folks may not have seen garam masala before. 
um, it's it's a combination. It's a blend. It's sort of the blend that in, in Indian cooking, you use it a lot. And I use it tons. I buy big bags of it. When I moved, I just scored this little bottle for right now. And it's one of the things, it's still got some of the coriander and some ground cumin and things in, but it's got a little bit of glow, cloves in this one and some cinnamon and just enough to give this a little bit of flavor. So I've got like this, I don't know if you can see it, but I've got like this super great looking, smelling, delicious mix in here. My husband's probably coming in in a minute for dinner. Now I'm gonna add tomatoes. This is four cups of chopped fresh tomatoes. You could use canned. I, I, I'm so stuck with it because I always use fresh for this. You could use a couple canned tomatoes. It would cut your cooking time down because what we're gonna do with these tomatoes, I've used all this juice. I scraped the cutting board when I did them. And so what I've done is just, I'm gonna let all that flavor just start to blend in and I'm gonna use just a little, a little sweetener, and I'm using date paste. Now, I never use sugar, um, and I'm really working hard to not even have that much maple syrup. This is actually a homemade date paste, which guess what it is? Soaked dates run through my blender. Um, I'm gonna add about a teaspoon of that. You can buy date paste, you see it all over the place. Um, this is one I picked up. I just looked at it. They do call it date syrup, but guess what? It doesn't have any added sugar. Um, mine looks, my the one I just made, uh, looks a little bit different color, but that's just probably a processing thing. So here we are. We're moving on. Now what we're going to do, and guess what? We're almost done. We are going to add the namesake. We're going to add kidney beans. So here I've got, these are, this is about three cans. This is four and a half cups of cooked kidney beans. I've drained them, I've rinsed them. I'm pouring them in. I know this pot's starting to look really big. I mix that around and I'm gonna add some broth. This is a, this is actually, I'll tell you now, it's two cubes um, of, a low sodium veggie broth cube. That's my favorite thing to get. I don't have any space in my new tiny kitchen, so we're not keeping cans or cartons of broth. Seriously, there's not even under the bed like I used to. And so what we have going is kidney bean curry. Loads of fiber in these kidney beans, loads of flavor because we're layering them. We're gonna let this cook down. It's gonna cook for about 40 minutes. So I actually do not have a pre-made dish. Forgive me folks, I'm a newbie. But what's gonna happen is the more you cook this, I'm gonna cover it and I'm gonna let it cook. And the more that happens, the more these tomatoes are gonna to start to concentrate. They're gonna to start to become a really, really fantastic looking curry. You're gonna have a lot, of, a lot of moisture in this curry, which is my preference. So it's sort of a Indian chili, I guess. Um, and what I like to do, we like to serve this with a rice, make a nice brown rice, um, add some lemon. When this finishes cooking, I'll probably squeeze half this lemon in. And then I'm gonna probably top this with uh, cilantro, sorry, um, it's, it's coriander in Europe, so I get confused. And I'm gonna probably top that for folks who like that, not everyone does. And that is the name of my game. And I am now ready to turn this over to Suzanne Fellows. And I apologize, I've gone a little bit over. Curry later, anybody who's in Scotland. Well, hello everyone. Thank you so much, Denise. That looks absolutely delicious. And we love curry dishes. So maybe I'll make that tonight for dinner. Um, welcome to Farmington Hills, Michigan. Today, I am going to be making a soup that I like to call everything but the kitchen sink considering I sort of go around the kitchen, figure out what which vegetables look like they're going bad and throw them into a soup. Um, it's a really great base that you can sort of change your veggies out, um, change out the seasonings and you still have an absolutely delicious soup. So what I have started here today is I've already been sauteing my onion with a little bit of alternating between vegetable broth and water. Um, 
an onion is a really great base for any soup. I actually think looking back at everyone's recipe, most of us have started today with an onion. You can use a sweet onion, you can use a um, stronger white onion, but it's a really good base whether you're making a sweeter soup or a spicier soup. It's a great base. It blends really well. It gives a soup a really creamy um, texture when it's blended and it offers a lot of flavor and it has a lot of very good health benefits. So we already have our onion started. The next thing we're gonna go ahead and, which I already added as well, are garlic. I'm using a smaller pot than what the recipe calls for. So today I varied the measurements, but I would follow the ones in your recipe to make a larger pot of soup or just divide it down. Um, the next thing we're gonna do is just start going through our vegetables. But actually before we even take that step, and we've gone around our, our kitchen, we've seen which vegetables look like they're going bad and need to be used. We'd start with those. And then we see maybe what else is missing. Are there other um, vegetables that can finish out the rainbow? So that way we have a really well-balanced soup that offers a lot of antioxidants and nutrients. So today I have cauliflower rice. And one thing you can do is rice the cauliflower yourself. You can start off with a full head of cauliflower, pulse it in a food processor, or so many places now sell pre-made um, cauliflower rice, whether it is frozen or fresh, it's great to start with. So I'm gonna add that in next. And again, because I'm using a smaller pot, I'm just gonna put in just a little bit of this. Um, then today I'm using zucchini. And zucchini technically is a fruit, but it offers a lot of good nutrients. And so we're gonna put this into our soup. Um, and I'm actually gonna add all of it. And when we're adding these vegetables today, I'm gonna to probably not blend this soup. The other day I blended it for you and I'll show you the example of that at the very end. But if you know that you want maybe a creamy background to your soup, but chunky vegetables, then only cook the only cook part of it and blend that part and then add the rest of the other vegetables in broth after is another way to vary the creation. I have a rainbow of carrots. Carrots offer beta carotene and vitamins and they're very, very colorful and beautiful. I'm gonna skip adding the spinach now because that's something we add at the very end. We just wilt it for a few minutes. I have eggplant. So these next two, these next two vegetables, my family claims that they really don't like either of them, eggplant or mushrooms. However, if you blend them down and you cook them first with your onions and blend them down, they sort of disappear in the background, but you're still getting the health benefits of them. And the same thing with the mushrooms. They're wonderful ground when you're trying to hide them from your family. And then from there, I'll add our seasoning. So today we have um, oregano, basil, coriander, rosemary, and some salt. And this is a really great blend for more of an Italian vegetable soup. But if you wanted to take the same sort of measurements and create your own soup, I would look and see what else you have. Maybe you might want to use some Southwest seasoning if you have an avocado that looks like it's going bad or you have some cilantro left over that you want to chop at the end. So the one thing I love about the soup is that it just sort of, it's a great way to learn how to cook soup and how to vary things so that you can really um, make it taste great for you and your family. So just gonna stir this up and then we'll add the broth. If you were wanting to um, blend this first and just have maybe some beans in it at the end, you could let this all simmer down for about 20 minutes, blend it, and then add in a grain, a bean, so you're offering some more fiber and um, some more protein. Quinoa is a great addition. If I know, like today, that I'm going to just leave this soup as is and I'm just going to let it simmer for a while, I would go ahead and add my quinoa, but making sure that I have enough broth in there to absorb up the um, to absorb that the quinoa I'm sorry is going to absorb. Otherwise, what I would do is blend it first 
and then add cooked quinoa at the end, like the same time that I would add my spinach. Or if I decided to use a can of beans, like I have here. Um, I did not add my tomatoes yet, which I will do now. One thing to consider is how much time you have when you wanna make a soup. If you are in a hurry, you could honestly take all of these vegetables, throw them into the Vitamix and let the Vitamix do the cooking. The Vitamix in most high power blenders, they build heat through friction as the blade turns and chops and it blends it down. And it's a great way to make a very quick, high fiber, high protein um, vegetable soup. But if you have more time and time for it to simmer in a pan, I would encourage you to do that. So in this case, I'm just adding about a quarter of a quarter of a cup of quinoa, and I'll also add an equal amount of extra broth so that that has time to absorb up and space to absorb up. And I would just let this cook. Many of us today talked about how soup was part of our childhood and it sort of many of us have shared family recipes. And in my case, I grew up with a pot of soup on the stove almost every day and my mom still makes soup almost every day. And so one of the things that I love to bring to people's homes, although we're not really going anywhere now, but one of the things I do love to bring, whether it's a tailgate or a um, just a party at someone's home is a pot of soup. And it's so easy to transport in a crock pot and um, it's really just a great, homey, warm, comforting food. And it's a great way to get our rainbow of vegetables in every day, a good source of protein, a great source of fiber. And it's really just a really great way to stay healthy. So this soup, I would just let absorb, let it cook. And over here, I have a bowl of soup from the other day in which I blended. I then added the spinach and then added the cooked chickpeas afterward. So I hope you enjoyed this. I want to I also add the spinach, but at the very end, right when you're about, right just a few minutes before you're about to serve it. But I hope you enjoyed this wonderful array of vegetables and technically fruit with the zucchini and learning a great way to create your own soup base. You can vary it and really take time to not waste and see what you have in your kitchen and substitute out from there because we have so many um, delicious fruits and vegetables that can be added and cooked that we really shouldn't let go to waste. I know that there are times when I have thrown away quite a bit of things that just somehow got trapped in the back of the refrigerator. So really take time, see what you have, um, create your rainbow every day and be healthy. And I'm gonna pass it on now to Jennifer in Louisiana. Thanks Suzanne, what a great teaching lesson on how to make soup that you just gave us there. That was wonderful. So hey, I'm Jen and I'm in Louisiana and it's January. It's cold outside. It's Mardi Gras season. The Saints play football tomorrow. It's a great time to make gumbo. So we are, I'm going to show you how to make a Louisiana gumbo that's much healthier than the regular version. So uh, Louisiana is a cultural mix, as I think everybody is pretty much aware, and gumbo is a great representation of that cultural mix in Louisiana. So the word gumbo actually comes from an African word, and it means okra. A lot of people aren't big okra fans, but it's a great way to get your okra and gumbo because you hardly know it's there. It's really mostly for the thickening of the stew. And that's our African influence. The American Indians influence on our gumbo is a spice called sassafras, which not everyone, it's from the sassafras tree actually, it's called filet, and not everybody uses it in their gumbo. I actually don't use it in my gumbo, but a lot of Louisiana swear by the filet powder, which uh, from what I have learned through my research, came about when we were making gumbo in the winter time before refrigeration and there was an okra to add to the stew. So filet is another thickening agent and a seasoning. A lot of people will sprinkle it on at the end uh, when they're ready to eat as a, as a topping or a garnish to their um, gumbo. Um, the French are the, brought, well, excuse me, let me do the French last because our Hispanic influence uh, is the trinity, the uh, cooking trinity for most Cajun foods, which is onion, celery, and 
green pepper and almost all Cajun cooking has a base of that trinity. And then the French influence is the roux, which is usually equal parts fat and flour. Well, I am gonna show you how to make a fat free roux today. Then it will cut out over hundred calories per serving on this dish. So fat free roux, roux, Roux is used for thickening and uh, flavoring to the gumbo. And the best way to get a fat-free roux is to get a heavy potum skillet like this or a cast iron skillet. And you put in enough flour to cover the bottom of your skillet with a little bit of thickness there. You don't want it too thin because the big deal is not burning the roux flour. Uh, and you add your flour to the cast iron pan and then you bake it in the oven on 400 degrees and you stir it every 15 minutes. Now this takes over an hour usually to get this dark color. This is the color of white flour before it is cooked into a roux flour. You can even go darker with this if you'd like, but you get at a risk of burning it. So um, yeah, it takes like an hour or so, but it can take that long on the stove when you are doing it with the fat, when essentially you're actually frying the flour and you have potential of burning the roux if you walk away from it for a second or burning yourself from splashing that hot oil onto your arm. So it's a great, great way to make roux and it does not sacrifice your flavor of your gumbo or the color, which is very important to a lot of people in Louisiana, the color of your gumbo. I have started making in the interest of time, I started sauteing my trinity, which is the onion, green pepper, and celery in this pot. And I started off on a medium heat, put the vegetables in, and then turned it down right away. And when you put the vegetables in in a hot skillet or a hot pan, the waters that are in these vegetables release and help the sauteing. Now, after it cooked a while, I'm trying to get it soft. I did add a little bit of water to it to keep it from sticking to the pan. So the Trinity is in here. It's the onion, the celery, and green pepper. And now I'm going to add a little bit of aromatic, which is some garlic. It's about a clove and a half of garlic. I'm just gonna stir this around until you start getting that wonderful garlic flavor coming up which only takes about a minute or so. Normally what would happen here is you would be cooking your roux on the stove and the oil and the flour and for an hour. And then when it gets to a nice dark coffee color, you would add your vegetables and then you'd have to saute that. But we have skipped that step and we are adding the roux in next. So this is about six tablespoons of the roux flour. And what I'm going to do is add it to my vegetables and stir this around until they are well coated. I don't know if you can see in my pan is a little deep. I can smell the flour. And again, I'm not wanting to burn the flour. So my vegetables are fully coated. They look very dry and crumbly in there. So what you do at this point is you just add a little bit of water and you stir that, I'm gonna turn my heat up a little, medium. Stir that until the flour is fully incorporated. Need a little more. If you'll notice, I'll show you once I get this fully stirred, I'm trying to get rid of the lumps. The roux changed to a nice darker color once you added the water to it. Okay, and this is actually what it looks like when you're stirring it with the traditional roux. Your vegetables are thick, kind of a muddy vegetable mix. All right, so my, my lumps are fully deleted or fully incorporated. Now I'm going to add the rest of this water. It's about five cups of water to six tablespoons of roux. Stir this around. Gumbo is so easy once you get past sauteing and making that roux. So when you do it in the oven and your roux is ready, which I made this yesterday, so it was ready today. And I keep it in my freezer, which is a great tip because uh, you can pull it out anytime and have your roux flour ready. So once the vegetables are sauteed, you just throw everything else in and let it cook. So I am adding a can of diced tomatoes to this, which actually sort of changes this from a Cajun dish to a Creole dish. 
You don't see a lot of tomatoes used in Cajun cooking, but Creoles do add tomato. I'm going to add my okra to this, which is a thickener. And I am going to cook that okra, the stew, until that okra actually starts to disintegrate. We do need to add our spices to this. So bay leaf is very important in Cajun cooking. Adds a lot of nice flavor to your stock. And then I have my seasoning here. So we have in here some thyme, some uh, allspice, some cloves, and the Cajun spice. Everybody in Louisiana has their favorite Cajun spice that they like to use. I have uh, several that I use for many different recipes and gumbo. I always use the Tony Setches, which you can find that all around the world these days. So that's great. I'm adding some uh, bouillon in here, chicken flavored or non-chicken, chicken flavored bouillon, which uh, in this particular instance, I'm using this not chicken brand. It does come in a low sodium option as well if you are uh, concerned about your sodium intake. And also this better than bouillon, that is a great option as well. Now in this, gumbo is such a blend of everything. Um, I, this is not on the actual recipe, but I'm throwing some collard greens in here. I had them in my fridge, so I'm throwing it in. And that's all you really need to add to your gumbo. So what I'm gonna do is turn this up to boil. And when it comes to a boil, I'm gonna turn it down to a simmer and then I'm gonna put it on the back of the stove and just let it cook for an hour or so until that um, okra begins to disintegrate in there and then you're done. But you can see it's already thickening up nicely and a gumbo is a thick stew. I have a bowl that I want to show you and I'll talk about the things that you can add to your gumbo at the end. Actually, I'll do that first. Let me say the end of the, this particular one, since we are watching the Saints games tomorrow and we're actually going to be uh, watching with some friends, some quarantine friends that we have, we're all in quarantine together. Uh, I am going to add some of this mindful chicken, shredded chicken in here. It um, will make it look more like a traditional gumbo, which is traditionally meat stew. Chicken is one of the main ingredients in most gumbos, but they also do a seafood gumbo and things like that. So this is a great shredded chicken. And it is less than, it's four grams of fat per serving. So it sort of fits the low fat guidelines. And then I'm also going to add some vegan sausage that I sliced up and I actually cooked it in the air fryer. These are much higher in fat than what we would normally want to go with. But I'll have to tell you when I put it in the air fryer, I get at least a tablespoon of fat left over in the bottom of my air fryer for each sausage link that I put in there. So uh, I highly recommend if you have an air fryer to use it, it gets a lot of the fat content out of your food. So what I'm gonna do when it's close to finish time for the gumbo, I'll toss these in and we will have a chicken and sausage gumbo for our football game tomorrow. This is a completed gumbo that I made yesterday. And in this particular one, I uh, baked some tofu squares, and actually I did those in the air fryer as well, but you can certainly do that in the oven. And I put in this one some jackfruit as well, which makes it look like some shredded chicken in there. I would get the canned jackfruit and drain it and rinse it, and you can either broil it in the stove, season it, or just throw it right into your gumbo and use it like that. And it makes it look like a chicken and um chicken and tofu gumbo in this instance. So in Louisiana, we serve it with rice and I like to use a basmati rice, has a little extra flavor. Put a pile in the middle and we garnish it with some green onion. And like I said, some people like to sprinkle a little filet powder on top of that. And then you have a delicious bowl of hearty, gumbo stew to enjoy on a cold day while you watch this New Orleans Saints play. Uh, that is it for me and I hope you enjoy Louisiana gumbo with our fat-free roux. Great. So now it's time for me to pass you over to Angelita who is actually one of my Food for Life fellow classmates. 
think you did. I am definitely going to try that recipe because that was one of my favorite and I've been missing it. So I'm so excited that you made that for us. My name is Angie. I'm in Greenville, South Carolina. And today I will be making a bug soup. Um, there's many different ways to make it. And um, so what it calls is you need to take your vegetables and you need to char them. Um, if you use a little bit of oil, a lot of people do that in a cast iron pan, or you can do it on a dry pan. Uh, that takes a little bit of time. So in order to save time, I just put it in my air fryer. I put it on rows at 400 for about 15 minutes, and it charred them beautifully. So then you take those vegetables and you put it in a stock pot with about eight to 10 cups of water. And you're going to add all your spices to it. The, the recipe has been linked onto our page. Um, but I'm going to go over it real quickly. So what you're going to use to make the broth again is the roasted vegetables. And then you're also going to add um, cinnamon. Make sure it's the, uh, the stick and not the ground cinnamon. And then you're also going to use whole star anise, and you're going to use whole cloves and um, ginger. You want to use the ginger. You want to make sure that that ginger is roasted as well as the garlic is roasted with all the vegetables. And again, all this will be in the recipe. So you put that, you let that boil for about an hour, add a few bay leaves in there. After it's boiled, make sure you taste it. Uh, to make sure you don't need to adjust anything. One thing that I added to the recipe and I'll be submitting a new one is a mushroom seasoning that really gave it this amazing mommy flavor. And I found that in an Asian store. It's just mushrooms. Here is the package. And it is, I mean, it brought this soup up to a whole nother level. So, um, when all that was done, I took more mushrooms, sliced them, put them in the air fryer again with a little bit of vegetable stock, and let those roast for about another 10 minutes to give it that meaty uh, flavor for the people who don't want to use any type of meat substitutes. That worked wonderfully. Now, if you do like the meat substitutes, then you add those to the stock once you've already. Um, put the vegetables through the sieve and took out as much of the beautiful, wonderful, um, luscious stock out of it. What you do also is I'm using rice noodles and it's just, I put them in a big bowl and I covered them with boiling water and you're gonna wanna let them sit for about uh, six to 10 minutes. Now, you don't have to use the rice noodles if you wanna up your protein. Um, in this, you can use mung bean noodles, and those are full of protein. There's like 25 grams of protein in a serving of mung bean noodles, and I find those at my local Asian store. You can also use buckwheat noodles. You can use whole wheat noodles. Um, but I really like the rice. But again, it's up to you. Whatever you choose to. Uh, you know that I'm sure it will be delicious. So once the um, noodles are done, you're just going to put those on the bottom of your bowl. And I load it up, so I think my bowl might be a little bit too small because I love to eat. And one thing that I really enjoy about this way of eating is that I eat until I'm full. There's no guilt, and I know that what is going into my body is healthy. And, excuse me, I'm making a mess. So I know what I'm eating is healthy, and I know it's healthy for my family. And especially right now that it's kind of cold outside, this just hits the spot. So here we go, more noodles. You're gonna go over here, and you're gonna get the broth. I wish you guys could smell my kitchen. It is amazing. 
So this is what really just makes your suit a hit or miss. Also, whatever bra you have left over, you can let it cool down and you can refrigerate it. It also can refrigerate it for about three, four days, or you can also um, freeze it and then use it later on. So I added some fresh mushrooms to that. Give you the roasted mushrooms. And to this, we're going to add some basil, which basil has vitamin and uh, has vitamin K and has vitamin A in it as well. So you're really just having a soup with a lot of really good vitamins. So if you're not feeling too good, I mean, who doesn't want this type of soup to make them feel better? You also can add some soft tofu for added protein, and there's like 10 grams of protein in uh, tofu. It has all the amino acids that the body needs as well. And it's also full of vitamins and minerals, non-GMO organic, of course. You want to add a little bit of cilantro. And again, this one has vitamin A and vitamin K in it. Bean sprouts are also wonderful for you. And they're an excellent uh, source of antioxidants, also full of vitamins and minerals. It gives it that nice little crunchy flavor. And jalapenos, I've got the red ones just to give it a nice color and contrast. But you can use the green ones if you like, or you can use the little um, red peppers that they sell at the Asian market. It all depends on how hot you like the food. And of course, you're going to sprinkle a little bit of scallion because, well, then that's what gives you just another layer of flavor. And to that, you can um, squeeze some lime or some lemon. I prefer lime, something about the lime with the cilantro and the jalapenos and this broth is absolutely amazing. If you want to add more vegetables to this, you can add some steamed kale, uh, some bok choy, things which what I have here, and you just lay that right there, and you've got a wonderful bowl full of vitamins, minerals, and something that's going to soothe you and help heal you and really just make you feel good all over. All right, well, thank you so much. And this is Angie, and I'm passing it over to Shoba now. She's also going to be making a version of uh, Thank you so much. Hi, Angelita. This is Sho I'm Shoba Swami. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm also making fur today, but with a twist. It's going to be a lot different from the one Angelita made. So today we're going to start with the noodles for fur. I have this big bag of organic bean vermicelli which is like almost like glass noodles. So I have a big packet of these. So I've used one small packet of, pack of noodles and I just pour some hot water over these noodles and then set them aside. Now we'll begin with all the other spices and all the other vegetables that we put in pho. Pho, as you know, is a Vietnamese dish and there are a lot of whole spices that we use. There are two ways to make pho, with whole spices or with powdered or ground up spices as well. Whichever is convenient for you and if you like a burst of extra flavor, go ahead and grind it to a paste or grind it to a powder. So I've used a little bit of coriander seeds, also called cilantro seeds, available in regular US grocery stores or in the Indian grocery store as well. Then a little bit of black pepper, all the measurements are there in the recipes that we've provided. A teaspoon or so of fennel, star anise, cinnamon, cloves, bay leaves. It has a burst of flavors. So in my version of four today, I ground up all of this into a spice paste, added it to about one quart of water and brought it to a rolling boil for about 15 to 20 minutes. And this becomes our stock. All you need is water and these spices. 
Once this is ready and it's boiling, once it comes to a rolling boil, I'll be adding all my vegetables because you don't want to overcook your vegetables. Here's broccoli. I'll be adding broccoli to this. And then I'll be adding my green bell pepper, about half a cup or a cup. It depends. If you like lots of vegetables, add more red bell pepper, another orange bell pepper, some carrots as well. And I have chopped up red cabbage. Cruciferous vegetables are excellent for our health. Broccoli, cabbage, Brussels sprout. These are the choice of vegetables I've used today, but you can use cauliflower, even steamed tofu or slightly roasted tofu in the oven. Any of this, any of the choice of vegetables that your family and the kids like, you can add. And then I have some greens as well. Don't forget to add your greens. We need to be eating a lot of greens every single day. And I had about a, a rainbow chard at home that I've chopped up and got ready. Now that we've added all this to the, the broth that was boiling, I'm going to keep it aside and just let the vegetables just steam or cook in that boiling, in that already boiled broth. I have another batch made ready for you. So I let that sit for about 10 minutes and our pho will be ready. So this I just cooked up ahead of time. Now the noodles are all ready. I strained the noodles and I've got these, you know, glass noodles that are bean noodles ready. And the vegetables, if they sit for about 10 minutes, they get nice and crunchy and cook really well. All you have to do is add all of this, all the vegetables that you love, add all the sp spice liquid that's in there, the broth, is so flavorful and so nice. Ginger is an antioxidant. Cinnamon is good for our health. We have so many different flavors here that bring out the best of this Vietnamese pho. And top it off with greens of any kind. Make sure you have lots of greens. As you all know, we as Food for Life instructors promote eating lots of vegetables and fruits, about a pound or two. I don't put salt or any of that on this soup, but you can, but don't forget to squeeze a wedge of lime or so as you taste it and eat it. You can eat it with chopsticks or a soup spoon. And there are many options that you could add. You could add garlic, you could add some a tablespoon of miso paste or soy sauce or rice wine vinegar, any of these or sriracha if you want. I do have some green jalapenos chopped up as well that you can use to garnish and put on top. And your Vietnamese simple and easy pho is ready to enjoy. Thank you very much. And now oh, I'm passing it over to Mark who will be our next Food for Life instructor on the show. Thank you. I hope they heard me. I cannot hear. Why can I not hear him? Hey, Mark, this is Dillip. Sorry to interrupt you, but we can't hear you. <laughs> uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> we get to see your entertaining presentation from the top again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oops. Can you hear me now? Absolutely. All right. <laughs> But you've got to do your dance again, Mark. 
Right, we, we will do the dance again. <laughs> All right, bear with me one second here. All right. Okay, so if you know that band, put it in the comment section of our Facebook page in the chat. Name that band, I'm going to give you one hint. It's related to this dish. And it's from the bands from the 70s. So um, kind of a tough week this week in, in the United States. So I'm feeling like I have to uh, look good to feel good. So um, anyways, uh, the dish that I'm gonna kick, that I'm gonna cook today is called a uh, vegan menudo. Vegan menudo. So menudo, I really think that when we're, um, especially when we're transitioning to the vegan diet, <clears throat> we've got to we've got to have dishes that remind us of when we were meat eaters, I believe, and also that take us back to our uh, our childhood. So this dish does both of it. So the original menudo, so menudo is uh, Mexican, and in Chicago there's a very large Mexican population. And um, when I used to when I worked, I worked at Loyola University Medical Center um, for about ten years. And a couple of the ladies in, in the department, I was in human resources, I was in organizational development training. Well, a couple of ladies were, were Mexican and they lived on the southeast side of Chicago. And on Saturdays, every so often, they would, they would go and pick up menudo at their local uh, restaurant. And the menudo that they, that they would bring me had the traditional ingredients of hominy, and beef tripe. Yes, folks, beef tripe. So I um, wonder why my weight was up and cholesterol was up and uh, blood pressure was up because I was eating beef tripe, which is cow stomach. Well, this has none of that. But we want some of those flavors and those textures. And one of the, one of the reasons I ate those wonderful um, dishes, uh, that wonderful dish was, was something my father and I ate when he was alive. He turned me on to it. He worked with a couple of Mexican gentlemen and that he would bring menudo home from them that their wives would make. And I ate that when I was a little boy. So, but today we've got a menudo that's 100% vegan. Um, it's, it's, it, there's a couple of steps to it and I wanna harken way back to when um, Philip talked about a, uh, the fact that you need to um, have a base in these soups and really all of our instructors talked about those basins, right? Well, the base in this soup is a menudo base, and I've got it here in my blender. In the blender, uh, what's in that blender are guajillo chilies. So the guajillo chilies look like this, right? There's all different types of chilies. If you don't have guajillos, um, you could also use the New Mexico ones, or the arbol chilies as well. So um, this really good, uh, really good uh, flavors, really depth of flavors of those various uh, chilies. But two chilies, so about six to eight chilies, you're gonna take the seeds out because those seeds are really, really hot. You're gonna put it under the broiler um, for about two minutes, don't burn it or else you're gonna have a charred taste to your, to your menudo base. And you're gonna take three cloves of garlic, a, a little onion, uh, four cups of water and um, some uh, not chicken, no chicken base. I like uh, better than bouillon. I think a couple of our instructors talked about it today. Our cooks talked about it today. Um, this does have a higher uh, sodium content, so I use it very, very sparingly. I think it was Carolyn that talked about, uh, Carolyn Strickland talked about using this. Um, yeah, I cut it in half, so it calls for a teaspoon per, per cup. I go like a half a teaspoon, if not a third of a teaspoon per cup just to really cut down the sodium. Then I don't add any sodium at all to the um, to the base, uh, to the uh, to the dish that I'm cooking with. So oregano and cumin and a little bit of pepper. So that's the menudo base. So all that stuff is going in the blender, right? So I'm gonna blend that up and um, I'm gonna it. Okay. Here we go. So everybody knows how what a blender looks like, but the idea really is, is that you're creating base, right? So then you're going to build your soup, right? So this is step number one. 
Um, then, in the, then in the soup itself, you're gonna uh, saute some onions that goes in the pot. So this is a one pot meal, by the way. So you can do all your sauteing and for the base in this pot, put everything then in your blender and uh, go ahead and um, uh, you know just leave whatever little bits were left in this pot. Um, then your onions, your carrots, uh, mushrooms. So instead of tripe, right? We're not going to eat tripe. We're not going to eat any any uh, meat-based products, anything from an animal. Um, but I use mushrooms, right? And uh, the mushrooms uh, that I chose today uh, were shiitake mushrooms and oyster mushrooms, and they're really, really, really um, uh, meaty, and they give some some really nice texture to to the soup. So go ahead and I use those, uh, garlic, uh, minced uh, jalapeno, six cups of water, right? Cook that a little bit. And then um, uh, after that boils for about five to 10 minutes. And again, the recipe is all, you know, is, is, is connected to today's video. It's on our page. Um, and then we're gonna add uh, hominy. So hominy is corn that's, um, that's processed, uh, kind of turns white. They use food grade lye to, um, to uh, puff it and it's sprouted. It's got a nice, really kind of sweet, um, aromatic flavor. It adds a little bit more texture and depth of flavor. That traditional menudo, by the way, does have uh, hominy or pizzole, right? Pizzole soup um, would have this. And then uh, cumin and oregano. Now the thing is, is oregano, there's, a, there's, a, there's several different types of oregano. We're using Mexican oregano. So um, this is Mexican oregano, and this is kind of your traditional European, if you will, oregano. So Mexican oregano has a little bit more citrusy flavor, uh, aromas, and um, uh, where European, kind of the classic European is a little bit more bitter. So in this one, we're gonna use our Mexican, Mexican, uh, uh, Mexican oregano. So um, then, uh, you know, cook that. And we're really talking probably the whole process here, about 40 minutes. But then you have about 10 cups of soup and you can eat this. And like a lot of people said, you know, a couple of, uh, you know, over the next couple of days as it cools and it's in your refrigerator, you take it out in the microwave, heat it up. The flavors continue to get deep and, and uh, get even more rich. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, uh, ladle a little bit up here. And you see how wonderful this is. Uh, like, do you have people interested? And put some in there. And then I'm going to um, take my garnishes. Now, you can garnish this kind of traditionally what you garnish it, garnish a menudo with. And I'm going to use my same types of garnishes. I've got uh, red onions, jalapenos, uh, cilantro, some green onions, and radishes. And then a little, little spritz of uh, lime juice, right? So I don't have any fresh limes. What I do is get a bunch of limes and I put them in, I, I squeeze the juice out, put it in ice cube trays, freeze it, and then I've got lime juice at the ready at any time. So that's what I did today. So I'm going to take my menudo now and let's see, I'm going to put some cilantro in there. Um, I'm going to throw some beautiful onions in there and then some radishes i'm going to put just a little bit of little bit of um lime juice now one of the things i always liked and you could also put red pepper i was tasting this before this is pretty spicy so this is a spicier food so just uh, be be wary if you like spice beautiful if not you cut back on those chilies you can even use chili sauce instead of instead of making the base right so that's that's something to think about as well but anyways so one of the things i do like to eat with this our tortillas, I'm going to show you a really quick way to uh, char up some tortillas. All I do is I go right to my uh, burner here uh, on my stove. I take my uh, tortilla and put it on. It only takes about four or five seconds on each side. You just want to heat them up really nicely. Uh, it gives a little bit of a charred flavor here and um, just kind of softens it up. You'll see actually when you get to that second side, the tortilla will puff up a little bit, and uh, and there you go. And then you just you sit and you dip and you eat, and it's just absolutely wonderful. So there you have it. Oh, by the way, folks, the name of that group that sang that song at the beginning that I so uh, wonderfully danced to was called Menudo.
it, it was a boy band from the 70s and the name of the boy, the name of the um, song was Cannonball. So um, anyways, there you have it, folks. Great. Thanks a lot. Uh, check me out at letseatgreat.com or, or on Facebook and Instagram at Let's Eat Great Food. Thanks a lot. And now back to Bill for some Q&A from the rest of the team. All right. What a great show so far. Thanks, everybody. And uh, uh, that was one of the questions, Mark. What was the song you were uh, uh, dancing to? And so you answered that. So for those watching us live, uh, we're uh, watching questions that are coming in. I've made a note of a few questions. Uh, uh, other cooks in the kitchen may have uh, questions they've seen as well. Um, one question that came up was about rinsing beans. Um, so one of the questions was about rinsing beans and, and whether it's important or not. And I'll, I'll quickly answer it, but then I invite any, somebody else to share their thoughts. So um, I almost always make beans from scratch, um, but I like to have some beans, uh, canned beans on hand. Sometimes they come in boxes because sometimes you want to make something and um, uh, you know, it'd be nice to have beans ready and you just don't have time. So I usually have a couple cans handy uh, and I like to rinse them. Uh, we try to buy canned beans that don't have salt on them, um, but even if they don't have salt, um, and I'll let Mark talk in a moment about aquafaba. That would be a good except, uh, exception with chickpeas. But what I like to do is the beans have been sitting in this fluid for a long time. I prefer to rinse it off and, and get the more, more pure bre uh, bean flavor. But uh, would anybody else like to um, take that about rinsing beans? And, and, and at the end, I, I want Mark to talk about aquafaba as well, please. Anybody else on? Well, I, I can talk about how come I, I normally rinse my beans um, because I found that it's just a little bit easier on our GI system. You, I feel like um, my family doesn't get quite so gassy if we do that. Um, so I would definitely say if you're not, um, you know, used to eating beans, I would definitely probably rinse those to begin with. Um, and we are pretty much used to to eating beans every day, but, um, you know, it just tends to hear about it if I don't. So, <laughs> um, so that's why we do it. And like I said, with the sodium, you know, especially if um, it's canned with um, salt already in there, you definitely probably should be rinsing those so you don't go over your sodium limit per day. That was our first show. Our first show back in May was on beans. And um, I, I just wanted to put a plug in. Beans are so good for you in so many ways, high in yeah. fiber, high in various vitamins. <clears throat> They're a superfood in many ways that some people say, I don't want to eat beans because they get gas or it gives digestive problems. So there's a lot of things you can do, but uh, just in summary, if you get used to eating beans, your gut microflora will get used to it and they'll welcome it and you will stop generating the gas. So during our time of, uh, you know, where we're not seeing so many people, this is an awesome time if you're not used to beans to get used to them and, uh, and, and you will adapt, your body will adapt. And uh, I can eat beans morning, noon, and night and not really generate gas. Did anybody else want to talk about um, rinsing beans or, or Mark, did you want to go ahead and talk a little bit about aquafaba? Yep. So aquafaba is um, the deciduous viscous liquid, if you will, from chickpeas. And I actually cooked with it last, um, last month in December. And uh, the interesting thing about aquafaba is it's, it's a relatively new uh, ingredient, if you will, in, in terms of cooking. So the research that I did, and if you want really a lot of information on aquafaba, go to aquafaba.com. So www.aquafaba.com. <clears throat> and uh, it was really started using it as an ingredient back about 2015. So about six years ago, five and a half, six years ago now. So you could use any of the viscous liquid from uh, beans. It's just that uh, aquafaba um, from chickpeas, it's a clear, it's a uh, neutral color, if you will. It's a light brown, uh, it's a clear kind of color, if you will. Um, and you wanna use, uh, you wanna use chickpeas that have, uh, you know, no or low sodium. Uh, so no or low salt, because uh, then it kind of gives a funny taste if you try to make, um, dishes with uh, aquafaba that has salt, made that mistake once. Um, but you can, make, um, you can make meringues from that, you can make whipped cream. I know a couple of our, of our guests here have made, um, make, posted a couple of pictures on our, on our instructor page. So I don't know if anybody wants to talk about uh, how they use the aquafaba for whipped cream. 
and I think I think Lajana was uh, Jana had used it um, had had uh, charted a little bit if you, if you flamed it a little bit on a on a chocolate dish it just it looked wonderful so it, you know you can use it just like any type of a meringue or whipped cream as well so um, yeah so aquafaba is kind of fun um, it gives gives that nice mouthfeel of whipped cream and uh, you could also use it as a replacement for oils and dishes. Um, I made, what did I mow? My wife's birthday was this past week and I made some cupcakes. She wanted some cupcakes, uh, whole grain cupcakes. And instead of oil, I used aquafaba and they just turn out so moist and wonderful. So uh, aquafaba is pretty um, versatile type of oil. So a question just came in from Randy and Susan Habeck. And I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your last name, Habeck or Habeck. And uh, the chef that made the curry spoke of something like garam masala. Please specify clarify what that is. Sounds wonderful. Garam masala is a spice from India. It literally means warm spices. And let me ask Shoba to share her thoughts on garam masala. <clears throat> Hi. Thanks, Dilip. Garam masala is just a combination of different spices from India uh, made out of uh, cilantro seeds, cumin seeds, a little bit of cinnamon, maybe a little bit of black pepper, cloves perhaps, and a combination of all these um, uh, spices that are ground up to a powder. So just like curry powder is made of different, dif different spices or different ingredients, similarly, garam masala is a combination of different spices from India. And uh, it's, it's, you'll find the recipe, it's very easy to find the recipe and make it at home, or you can buy it at the regular American grocery store or at the Indian store as well. It's all already available. And there's one choice that I'd like to mention is you get a packet of whole spices already ready to go to make garam masala in the Indian stores. You can buy the combinations and the proportions are already put together for you. So you can pack it and grind it up in your small coffee grinder and you'll have garam masala fresh smelling very fragrant uh, garam masala for your home thank you that's a great tip another tip is uh, my mom used to do a lot of indian cooking so my mom was a very early immigrant from india she came from india in the early 60s and there's like literally about a thousand people believe it or not from south asia in this country in like 1960 61 and so wherever we moved she ended up becoming in, uh, in many ways the center of the local indian community and she was in the newspaper for her indian cooking number of times so one thing my mom would do is she would um, freeze her spices she'd buy spices in very mm -hmm. large quantities so if money is an object, if you're cooking Indian food or food that requires some Indian spices, you can go to an Indian grocery store. It's usually a lot cheaper and often you can get it organic. Not, it didn't used to be the case, but now you can get it organic. Or if you're buying it, you know, just occasionally, you may go to your uh, regular supermarket. It'll cost more. Uh, but if you're not going to be using a lot of it, then it may not make a big difference. But if you do buy a large quantity of, of Indian spices, many other spices, uh, my mom, she had a whole um, in the garage, a whole refrigerator and the freezer was stuffed with spices. <laughs> to yes. keep them fresh. Yeah, um, there, was, um, there was an interesting comment that came in. Uh, Angelita, you made a really good comment. You said that you like to eat till you're full. And that's one thing all of us in the Food for Life program talk about. And the reason I think Angelita said that is because of the high fiber content. But Angelita, mm -hmm. would you like to share a little bit more about fiber and eating till you're full and eating as much as you want of the wonderful foods that you make? Yes. Um, so what what I've learned is the more fiber that I take in, the fuller that I am, but there's no guilt to it because it's all healthy. So um, before I started this way of eating, I would eat a lot and then I would feel guilty and then I wouldn't eat and then I would feel guilty for not eating because it was a yo-yo. And then when I found this whole food, uh, plant-based way of eating, I realized that I can eat until I'm full and I don't feel sick like I used to when I would eat a lot. I would feel so bloated, but your body just tells you, okay, you're full, that's enough. And um, if I still have food left in my bowl, I can push it away and say, you know what, I'm, I'm done. As before, I couldn't do that. And I think maybe it had a lot to do with the salt and the fat that was added into that food because 
my taste receptors just were like, give me more, give me more, give me more. And so now I eat until I'm full. I'm very satisfied and I stay full three, four, five hours. And then I'll have a little snack and it's usually my body is craving fresh fruits, fresh vegetables. Like right now I'm snacking on the bean sprouts with just uh, lime juice and just a touch of salt. And it's so <laughs> satisfying to me. Before I would want potato chips or pretzels and then that would lead to something else. But here I'm like, okay, it's healthy. There's fiber in all this stuff. So that's why I love this way of eating. And I know a lot of my clients also, um, I'm teaching them about that. You know, I'm like, eat the, the sweet potatoes, eat the regular potatoes, eat the carrots and the celery and, and the oatmeal. And they're, you know, they're starting to get that light that I got. It's like, you know, the, the bulb just goes off and it's like, oh, there it is. That's the magic. That's the answer. Um, so yeah, that's why, that's why I love this way of eating. We should, uh, Jill Krebs made a very nice comment a little while ago. She, she just made a new comment about micronutrients, but I wanted to pick up uh, about five minutes ago. Jill had mentioned one of our guests who's watching right now live. We love our uh, G-bombs. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by G-bombs, but uh, from Dr. Joel Furman, but I did want to bring that up that um, we should take a moment and talk about, uh, and maybe Denise is one of our newest cooks and the chef can do this, can tell us what is the Food for Life program? And then after Denise does that, I, I have a comment about uh, some other folks who you know promote eating the same way. So Denise, can you tell us what is Food for Life? Who are we? Sure. Um, so Food for Life is a, is a program that, that really highlights um, plant-based eating. We're talking a lot about encouraging people and un having an understanding about eating whole foods. So trying to eat foods in their, in their whole state. So I think today's a great example. People were cooking lots of beans. Beans are just a whole food. That's why that fiber that we were talking about and getting full going to make you feel so good. And then there's a concentration here about really trying to eat low fat. So I know when I did my recipe, I talked a lot about not using oil because that was sort of the last thing that I left was not using oil because just like oil will start to clog your drain. Yeah, that's what's happening inside your heart and your arteries and things. And so I think really what Food for Life is representing to us is a, is it's a diet is the wrong word. I think of it as a lifestyle. It's a real lifestyle that centers around food. And then that opens up that door to you of creating really flavorful food where you're not dependent on eating oil. You're not dependent on eating cheese, dare I say, because, because you fulfilled yourself in other ways. And then you, I'm sorry, you forget about those things. They do go away. So really that's the essence to me of the Food for Life program. It's really an emphasis on doing things that are kind to your body. And then they turn out to be really kind to your soul as well. Because um, as you were someone to mention, you know, you start to feel lighter. It starts to feel better. Um, you feel happy about food and you, um, the battle ends between the food and the weight and the guilt and all of that ends. So really it's an emphasis on whole foods, the least processed, the better no animal products, and also a real emphasis on low fat, which is once you're rid of the animal products and the dairy, all of those things, not cooking with oil, um, guess what? You don't have to worry about the fat content too much anymore because it's pretty much gone away. So that's kind of my summation, if you will. That's great. And Jill was talking about Joel Furman. So there's many people in the space. So mm -hmm. certainly we're part of Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. And I just posted a link, fflclasses.org. You can find out if there's any instructors in your area. We have instructors, I think about 300 instructors all over the United States and in a number of other countries, including Italy and Scotland and uh, China, I believe, and Canada, uh, Australia. Dominica. Dominica, yeah, we have a cook mm -hmm. in the kitchen from Dominica, and uh, but but it's it's not just us. One thing I I'm so uh, uh, pleased that I'm part of the physicians committee team is that we insist on doing everything based on evidence. So what we're saying is based on a lot of evidence that supports this style of eating. Uh, I highly recommend anything by PCRM. Neil Barnard, who started our group years ago, is uh, is a superstar and. Um, and then there's um, 
Michael Greger, nutritionfacts.org, and he is very uh, careful. He, he documents all these wonderful benefits of foods. Um, there's uh, Brenda Davis, my favorite nutri- one of my favorite nutritionists, and um, um, uh, Colin Campbell, who's done some very important biochemical research. He, may, he was involved with the film Forks Over Knives. I have to mention the film that I was involved with, which is called Code Blue. And I also want to mention Code Blue is a film that shows how a wonderful a friend of mine overcame uh, MS. She is symptom-free by moving towards a plant-based diet. And I, I want to mention Suray Stancic is her name. Uh, and she is, uh, her book, she wrote a book based on the, the, the journey she's been on and it's in the bookshelves now. So, so look for that. So there's a lot of people in this space. But let's, let's move on to a few more questions. Jen, you, um, you talked a lot about Louisiana and um, many people were commenting how beautiful your necklace is. <laughs> so you talked about some foods, uh, roux, and I think it's pronounced filet. I, I uh, wasn't familiar with filet. I think I've seen it before. And uh, could you, do you mind taking a moment and telling us a little bit more about some specific Louisiana foods like roux and filet? And I know you, you demonstrated the roux, but could you talk a little bit more, please? There, can you hear me? I'm sorry, yes. I think I'm muted. There we go. <laughs> so those are ingredients that we use in our cuisine. So yeah, we've got gumbo and etouffee and uh, red beans and rice. So there's a lot of foods that are well known to be from Louisiana. Most of it starts with that Trinity that I mentioned, and then a lot of it with the roux whenever it's saucy. So roux, like I said, it's usually 50% fat, 50% flour. And a lot of the fats they use are you can use canola oil or butter. They use uh, duck fat and lard, all those fats and um, that are, are artery clogging. So um, making the roux to thicken your stew or to thicken your, your sauce when you're sauteing um, or making, um, uh, I don't know, a creamy sauce, then um, the more you cook it, the more flavor comes out of it and the nuttiness comes out of the flour, the more you saute it or cook it in the oven like I do. But you could also do it on the stove if you wanna stand there and watch. The whole point of doing it in the oven is to help give you some free time. You don't have to babysit it so much. But filet, I don't use filet. Uh, I don't like to use things that you have to go out and search for um, and you can't normally find in a regular grocery store. Uh, Louisiana, you can usually find filet, but I don't know in Chicago if filet would be an ingredient that would be on your store shelf, but they use it as a thickener as well. And like I said, it came about because of refrigeration. We couldn't keep okra in the wintertime to thicken the stew. So they would use filet, which the American Indians actually introduced um, to uh, the New Orleans and the, the Cajun crew in the South to um, took the sassafras leaf, which the sassafras tree grows abundant down here. And that's often what they, uh, or they used to make root beer out of <laughs> too. Um, I don't think they do anymore, but um, what other great ingredients that are Cajun? Of course, the uh, Cajun spice, um, hot, hot and spicy is what a lot of Louisiana's like, but um, you can adjust that to your to your liking yeah hey hey jen this is mark you know chicago doesn't have um filet but they do have a football team that's going to beat the saints tomorrow so it's well <laughs> mark, you know, we used to live in chicago so i'm a little torn tomorrow oh. but, uh, <laughs> we left the bears we lived in the lived in chicago when uh, the bears won the super bowl so uh, we uh, we do the super bowl shuffle every once in a while here we go <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, we're actually going to watch with some friends of ours that are from Louisiana. So we, I don't know if I need to play, which side of the fence I need to yeah, play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kidding aside, I, I, I think the Saints are going to win, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're a good team right now. They're they really are. Good. I'm not sure if she's having audiovisual problems, but I wanted Stacy. We were talking about interesting ingredients, so I don't know, Stacy, if your audio is working. But can you talk a little bit about a number of other ingredients came up? For example, miso. Shoba had mentioned miso, and that's a that's a great food I like to use. Uh, and I know you're a big. Um, uh, you and I both are uh, big fruit advocates. <laughs> so uh, if you can if you can speak up, uh, Stacy. I don't know if your audio is working. Can you share a little bit about? Um, interesting ingredients like uh, fruits and how we can integrate them into soups. It seems kind of counterintuitive. 
Oh, hi. Yes. No, I am having um, visual issues, but um, I am here audio. And so, well, gosh, fruits into soups. Uh, Dilip, I loved your watermelon gazpacho idea. And, you know, gazpacho in general is usually made with tomato. Um, tomato is a fruit. So that's another way to incorporate fruits into our soups. Um, and oh goodness, what else? I just, I love fruit in general and all different um, sorts of tropical fruits. I'm trying to think of how you could incorporate like a mamey sapote, which is a really, really custard like um, tropical fruit into a soup, which you probably could, um, especially the black sapote you could incorporate into perhaps like a black bean soup because it's very thick and very hearty. Um, and speaking of miso, this is kind of just bouncing around with fruit and miso and different spices, but speaking of miso, I will take any whole vegetable and basically boil it and add just a little bit of miso and then throw that all into my blender and make a delicious soup with just one vegetable. It's super easy and super satisfying as long as you're using like a nice starchy vegetable such as like a sweet potato or um, like carrots like you use dill up um, something that's more you know more satiating um, and that's one of my favorite things to do miso is one of those it's basically soybeans that are fermented and really lends great flavor to sauces and soups alike um, and then I think you were just asking about spices but one of my favorite spices to add to the top of any soup that I make is, um, oh goodness, I was just talking about it, um, sumac. And it's ground sumac. It's basically not the poison sumac that people think, but it <laughs> is, it is um, the berry of the sumac plant that really gives you a ton of antioxidants, but it also gives you an umami flavor. So that is spelled S-U-M-A-C. And that is used in za'atar. It's used in Greek cooking a lot um, it, in different spice blends, but sumac on its own lends a lemony flavor that really freshens up a dish. And I will put it on top of everything, mashed potatoes, soups. It kind of lends the same umami flavor, meaning that it really hits all parts of your taste bud at once, um, similar to how miso does without the salt. And uh, a comment just came in about apples being great in carrot soup. I have put apples in carrot soup. It adds a nice uh, sweetness. I, I love apples. Right now, my favorite, my long running favorite apple is um, probably, uh, I, Honeycrisp is one of my favorites, but um, um, but uh, uh, Pink Lady is one of my favorites. But right now, we're, we're getting these wonderful organic sugar bee uh, apples that are so, so good. But I wanted, when I think of ingredients, one of the first persons I think of is Karen Osborne. And Karen, I wanted you to share a little bit about your background because you have an interesting educational background about ingredients. And, uh, and hats off to you, Karen, because of you, I've been cooking with cranberries quite often now. I, uh, I actually tried cranberries in my soup. My family didn't like it, I did. I liked the color it added. And uh, I use cranberries now. Uh, last night I made my uh, winter fruit compote with cranberries and it's, it's really thanks to you that that's become a new favorite. So can you share something about uh, ingredients that you like and your background with ingredients? Oh, um, so my, my background, I, um, I really came to understand food as medicine by, um, I mean, it really, it really is medicine. And I mean, that's the whole physician's committee thing is like healing yourself with plants instead of pills. Um, so I, about 20 years ago, I used to get antibiotics like every other month until I got turned on to uh, what food could do for me. Haven't had, actually it was more, over 20 years ago and I have not had antibiotics since. So I got real into what, uh, ingredients can do for you um, and just uh, in culinary school uh, and then uh, lots of lots of books uh, but really just um, experimenting um, seeing what uh, I like the smoked paprika everybody's been using smoked paprika and it's so good um, and, and we should make the point that there are uh, if it's sweet smoked paprika, you can get really spicy. And if you're uh, looking for smoked paprika, you want to get the sweet, unless you want that 
a hot bite in your dish. The, the, the sweet, uh, the peppers are actually smoked. Uh, they're dried, smoked while they're dried for like 10 to 15 days. Golden Parks is real good. It's oak. They're smoked over oak wood. And it uh, imparts that flavor into your dish. So like my dish, my uh, stew has one teaspoonful and the whole dish is, is has a nice smoky flavor. You can put more. I just, uh, you know, didn't want it to be an overpowering smoke, but it, it just gives it a nice, a nice flavor to all. And it's often that that makes the big difference is the specific ingredients. There was a comment here uh, by KN Peak. I'm so interested to see the brands that instructors use, like the mushroom powder from the Asian market. I hope they put them in the recipes. And that's actually a really good idea. And I I'd encourage all of us, myself included, if there are specific brands, let's let's add that. We can update our current recipe for this month, and we can maybe in the, for future ones. Um, so I learned, for example, I, I, I feel kind of ignorant because it seems like it's what everybody's been doing for decades, and I, not me, <laughs> is smoked paprika powder is something I've never used. And so <clears throat> I'm grocery shopping in another hour or so. <clears throat> Stacy was talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, ingredients. I'm a citrus fiend. I love citrus. Uh, I, I just totally love citrus. And the co-op, they all know me. I, I don't know if they're uh, hiding their citrus because they know I come on Saturdays, but it's 50% off. They have a special for owners today. I'm so excited. <laughs> I just love citrus. Um, um, Carolyn, I wanted you to share a little bit. We were talking about ingredients like uh, smoked paprika and other things. You're an expert at um, at uh, um, grilling. So are there uh, ingredients that you come up with that the grill helps you uh, basically change something, change the dimension of a food? I, I know, for example, I don't grill, but when I uh, stovetop um uh, roast my bell peppers, they taste so much richer. So did you want to share about grilling as uh, perhaps a, a technique that we could then integrate in soups? Oh, sure. Um, yes, grilling, because it's such a high heat, it's almost like broiling, I guess. Um, but grilling can give your foods more of that charred um, flavor to it. So like we'll grill tofu sometimes, tofu steaks, grill cauliflower steaks, grill um, lots of vegetables. So we, we tend to chop up like a whole bunch of vegetables in the summertime. We don't do a huge amount of grilling in the wintertime because it's pretty cold out there. So we don't really want to stand outside grilling. Um, it's more of a summer thing for us. Um, although it's not as cold here as it is in a lot of places where you guys are. <laughs> but uh, We're in Montgomery, it's not that cold. But um, in the summertime, we'll take things like green tomatoes, um, which are excellent, and grill those. Instead of like in the South, people eat a lot of fried green tomatoes. We chop them really thick into thick slabs and put them on the grill and get them charred on both sides and have grilled green tomatoes instead. So it'll bring out that really nice depth of flavor in it. Um, maybe just even adding a little bit of pepper and garlic powder. And then, of course, smoked paprika, because that's a really nice smoky flavor. Um, you don't necessarily have to add smoked paprika when you're grilling because you can get a smoky flavor on your grill by throwing in some wood chips um, into a grill. But yeah, we love to grill here. In fact, I have a grill pan just to simulate grilling <laughs> in the winter time. So, but I was going to point out to Dill, um, I saw a question about um, spices, herbs and spices, and penzes. Spices is something that somebody commented on, and penzes is actually penzes.com. Lots of great herbs and spices on Penzes. It's one of my favorite places to get really high quality herbs and spices. There's a lot of, you know, the, the Spice House, I think is another one, but there's a lot of different online entities. Um, Penzes does have some actual stores. There's one in Birmingham, but mostly I think they're up north in, I think they started in Wisconsin, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but we have one in Birmingham here in Alabama. Um, I usually just order it online, but I did see that question come up about Penzes. So excellent spice store. Cody, I was w wondering if you'd be willing to take a moment, both you and I have children and um, I, I loved how you had Ella helping you in the kitchen. So um, in terms of not just soup, but in general, do you have, uh, you have different ages. I have one child, but you have three. Do you wanna take a moment for those, of, those who are watching the show who may have children of how you involve children and what uh, you do at different ages to keep them safe and engaged? Yeah, sounds great, Dilip. So, 
Yeah, you saw Nora. Nora just turned four not too long ago. And then Ella is nine and then Ava is almost 12. And so of course Ava can do more things independently. And I kind of just say, you know, just do everything safe. I've, I've kind of trained her on how to start the stove top, you know, but I still put things in the oven and take them out for her just in case. And um, and she's really good about, you know, making sure that she asks when she does need help. And I'm always, you know, readily available for her, but she can pretty much make um, a, kind of a simple meal just all on her own, which is great. And she's actually wants to do a whole meal once a week. So I'm like, go for it, girl, you know, just go for it. It's so fun. And Ella, Ella's really getting into it. Um, like I said, today, chili was one of her favorite recipes. So she was um, kind enough to join me today. And she, um, you know, she's still learning to cut, you know, we have the safety gloves for all the, all the girls. Ava doesn't really use them anymore. She feels pretty um, confident about not cutting herself. So that's great. Um, Ella still needs to wear the gloves if she is going to use a sharp knife. Now, Nora, she definitely always has to wear gloves if she is to do anything with the, <laughs> the sharp knife. And I'm always right there with her. And Nora, it's just a matter of whatever she's interested in, you know, let her try new things. Um, that's been a big part of it. And just including your kids and cooking makes them want to eat all these different, um, you know, different types of legumes, um, fruits and vegetables and grains. So if you involve them, they're more apt to actually eat them. And, you know, especially if they help make the meal because they're proud of what they made. So, and it's also a great way to introduce if you have a family member coming over to eat and maybe they're not vegan, um, you know, if your kid helped with that, they can say, oh, you know, who made this? And the girls will say, oh, I did. And then they'll be like, oh, yeah, you know, maybe they'd be more apt to try it knowing that the child did it, especially if it's a grandparent, right? <laughs> um, uh, I, I agree with you, uh, Cody. I teach in the schools. And um, when I work with, I work with uh, K through four primarily and sometimes middle school. And when they know Chef Dillip is coming, they're all so excited and they love getting in the kitchen and, and working with me. So engaging kids is a, is a great thing to do. Mm -hmm. Um, let's, we have a couple more questions before we'll probably have to wrap up, but um, um, I wanted to ask um, if um, uh, Jeanan, if, um, oh, I don't see Jeanan there. Ah, oh, there's Jeanan, okay. So Jeanan, um, we are really lucky to have you. We're lucky to have each one of us. You're in Italy and I love the geographic, dis you know, how we're geographically dispersed. So can you talk about, um, Italians are well known uh, for using all sorts of fresh ingredients. When my family visited um, visited uh, Italy, we, we were just so taken with the, the wonderful um, flavors in Italy. Can you talk about, because um, you've lived different places as well, um, about ingredients in Italy and how, and how uh, you know, when you make soups and other dishes, how it changes, um, uh, you know, when you're in Italy versus, I think you spend time in Turkey and you've been in the United States. So do you notice that there's differences, certain things taste better in certain countries? Yeah, you're, you're muted. <laughs> okay, John, and we, we can't hear you. Nope. Okay, Jean, and so if you if you figure out the audio, just just pipe in. But um, uh, are there any final questions before we wrap up? Does anybody see any questions on Facebook or anybody want to address something we haven't talked about? Great. Well, let me remind people that we're on, uh, Cody and I, as well as our colleague Ella, and our kids will be on next week for a kids program. It's our first non-cooking program. Uh, and then, um, uh, Mark, do you want to talk about our upcoming shows? Do you remember our next few shows? Well, I think next month is Heart Healthy, right? Um, yeah. So that's right around, that's a little bit before Valentine's Day. So you will be making heart healthy uh, recipes. Um, you know, heart disease is the number one uh, killer in the United States. Um, and, um, you know, I think... Uh, uh, I think Karen was talking about food as medicine. So um, there's a great connection there to Valentine's Day, taking care of your heart 
and food and everything. And then you now we've got a, a May, uh, I'm sorry, in April, it's March and April show scheduled at this point. I think we've landed on a, um, a topic, have we? Right, we haven't, and there's, there's, uh, we have such talented folks on the team. I think that we have essentially an infinite number of ideas. So we've talked about all sorts of things, and so hopefully in the a week or two to come, we'll have maybe the um, uh, the March show uh, figured out. I'm kind of hoping for spices, but we'll see. There's uh, uh, a lot of things in the offing, so. Mm -hmm. So yeah, please keep uh, an, an eye on somanycooks.com. Uh, That's our website. And then on Facebook, facebook.com slash somanycooks. And you'll see information about our upcoming shows. And uh, I think Carolyn's going to play our theme song, I think at the end, but oh, we're not. Okay. okay. Oh, you are. I am. Okay. So I before am. before we do that, any anybody want to throw out a promo about something cool you're doing that you want people to know about? I talked about Code Blue. Does anybody else have something you want to share? So I have, my classes are coming up. It's called uh, No Calorie Counting uh, Weight Loss. No Calorie Counting Weight Loss. So um, it's right along the lines of what uh, I think Angelita was talking about, about using fiber. Um, also a lot of fun stuff we talk about in the class with respect to uh, appetites uh, in terms of um, hunger. Uh, one of the things that we find on a vegan diet is um, I don't get that hangry anymore, hungry and angry. And it has a lot to do with, <laughs> with the micronutrients, right, that, that, that we're eating on, on this diet. So um, it's based on uh, PCRM's 21-day uh, kickstart program, but no calorie counting dieting. So. And, and I have to mention, um, maybe, um, uh, maybe somebody... Um, uh, how about uh, Denise can talk about what is the 21-day kickstart and... and um, uh, so the 21 day kickstart, why don't you first tell us what it is? And I, and I have something interesting to say about that. Sure. Um, so the 21 day kickstart is actually, it's a program through physicians committee. So PCRM. Um, and it's, it's a, it's a kind of a structured program um, with recipes, with guidance, with food and with the, the evidence to support why those things are good for you. And it's really just about a kickstart. It's about, telling yourself, I'm going to give this a try for three weeks. You're going to eat whole food, plant-based, low-fat food. It's very, very delicious. There's um, lots of recipes even on the um, PCRM website. All of us as certified, certified instructors, we all do teach that course. Um, myself, I haven't scheduled any yet because I just moved countries. Um, but uh, it, it's really a, a kind of a help for people. So for those folks in particular who say, I'd really like to do this, where do I start? I don't know. I don't know what to eat, how to eat. I don't know how to, I don't cook. Um, this is a really great way to learn how to do it, but even more important in some ways is why you're doing it. So that when somebody comes along and asks you, oh, but what about your protein? You'll have some answers for them. Um, so it's a, it's a really great program in particular for people who really want some support on, on the trip through and some a real easy way to get yourself started um, and give it a try. I, I would tell folks, if you're just interested, three weeks is, is sort of the, the time it takes to create a new habit. It's a great time of the year to do it as well. So um, I can't encourage people enough to give it a shot. It's a great, it's a great program. It is great and it's free and you get support. So you get an email every day with some yeah. suggested recipes. But the thing I wanted to say about uh, the 21 day kickstart is that uh, this month, January, uh, January 1st through 21st, they've picked a few of us. Um, I did one on January 2nd and uh, we're actually East Coast 3.30, it's a California based program. So they're lunchtime, 12.30. Uh, I don't know if anybody else here is participating but, but I was January 2nd. Um, and uh, there's like 300 of us, so I don't know how they picked us, but uh, you can watch us at 3.30 East Coast time uh, every day, January 1st through 21st. Um, so I did the second day of the kickstart, and uh, I know um, one of our um, instructors, their husband-wife team in um, Michigan or Wisconsin, uh, they were on an hour ago, and, uh, and they did today's. So um, I wanted to comment that we just got some really, really nice comments. We got... Uh, 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 Janice uh, said, 
She's uh, watched every single one of her shows and that's awesome. It's Janice Zintek Dorn. Thank you, Janice. We love having you and, and everybody else here. Uh, you know that uh, we've been, it's been taking a while, but at some point these shows will get out on Plant-Based Network. We have a few of them out. And so you can see the edited versions there as well and share it with folks. Uh, these shows, if you miss live, you can see recorded. Uh, and then um, there was also a comment about, uh, I missed it. Um, oh, about, uh, I can't remember who said it. Oh, it, it was also Janice. Every recipe you make is heart healthy. And Janice, you're absolutely right. That's why we're a little struggling in terms of what we're going to make because anything <laughs> we make is, is heart healthy. But we decided, I think, to do the heart healthy class because it's Valentine's Day. Uh, and, uh, and so for that reason, but, uh, you know, um, our Facebook feed is live all the time. If you guys have comments, say, hey, uh, please consider having a show on such and such. We're all ears. We're very happy to hear suggestions. We have a spreadsheet, which is very long with ideas. We're always happy to add more ideas. So final go round, anybody else? Mark, Angelita, Carolyn, Karen? I, yes, John, I yeah. have, I'm going to be teaching some Carolyn. actually in-person classes, which will be socially distanced and masks will be required. Your temperature will be taken when you come in um, at a couple of different YMCA's here in Montgomery. So if you are in Montgomery or the river region, river region as we call it in Alabama, because um, we have a big river that runs right through the middle of town. So there's the river region, which encompasses you know, several several counties around Montgomery, but it will be through the YMCA, two different locations at the Y um, coming up very soon. So we don't have dates quite yet on that. But um, yeah, if you are in Montgomery, then you can message me on Facebook and I can give you dates when we get them. And in terms of our Food for Life classes, and then we'll go to show by, um, uh, you can find any Food for Life classes scheduled near where you are is uh, fflclasses.org and we, we posted exactly. it. Exactly. Right. Shoba, I know you do a lot of cooking there. T t share with us some of the things that you have going on. Um, I'll be teaching another 12-week uh, class beginning on the 20th of January at Morehouse School of Medicine alongside a doctor who is 100% plant-based for the last 25 years. So um, we are teamed up pretty well and have these classes, 12-week classes, three times a year. So all through the year, pretty much, we're teaching these classes. And I also am going to start my own classes on a monthly basis. That's all I've been doing. I've not been cooking uh, the lip anymore. Um, <laughs> true, tired, interested. Now I'm moving on. <laughs> it's a lot of work. <laughs> Uh, by the way, welcome to Diane Kerwin. She just posted, this is my first show. It's been great, thank you. So we love, tell your friends and colleagues about it. Uh, we, we love having uh, new and, and veteran watchers. Anybody else, any other cooks? Want to share no, anything? I would love to share. And a sorry, everybody, again, that my video is not working. I switched to a new phone and all of a sudden it's not working now. So um, this is Stacy Heine and I am with the Urban Pharmacy and I put in the Facebook feed um, a link to my free Facebook group. It's a, it's a lifestyle wellness group, largely about plant-based nutrition, but also about other things that have to do with our longevity. And I am about to host a free workshop starting on January 25th. For anybody that's in that group, they can follow along. It's for one full week. I'll be going live every day at 11 a.m., educating people about how to shift their mind space to a more healthful place, you know, believing in themselves, and then going into plant-based um, and how to transition. And then also um, a little bit about how to decrease your environmental toxins. So it's just going to be a little bit you know, of everything, but it's going to be a full week and I would love to have you. You know, we didn't even talk about that, but there's so many benefits to plant-based eating. It's the best thing by far you can do for the environment. If you, if you care for the environment, it's, it's the best thing by far. Uh, so, and it's, uh, you know, of course for our health and uh, certainly the animals are happy when we don't eat them. So there's lots of good, good reasons to go plant-based. Um, by the way, I, I just feel so um, lucky to be in this community. I learned so much from every one of the other uh, cooks in the kitchen, all the other Food for Life instructors, and uh, a special uh, hats off to the new folks who've joined us. And they're not new at all. They're novice. They're not novices in the, any word, any stretch of the imagination. They're veteran cooks. They know a lot about nutrition, but we're so lucky they said, hey, we want to cook with you guys. And that's Shoba Swami in Atlanta. Thank you, Shoba, for being part of the team. Uh, also, Di um, also um, Denise Perez. And I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your last name it's from Perot. Scotland. What, what was it? It's Perot. 
a row. I said, it's fine. Yes. Yeah. So it's, it's uh, we're so lucky now to have somebody in Scotland. I know you're not Scottish, but you'll pick up. I spent some time in Scotland and I love, we had vegan bed and breakfast we stayed at. Uh, oh, and by the way, somebody, Stacy, is asking for your link. And, and thanks, Stacy, as well to you for joining our team. Uh, and please re repost your link. Somebody's asking, Stacy, hi, Nee. Thanks so much for being part of us. It's the, the, the only bad thing about welcoming you guys is, to be honest, it took me a, a number of, of these so many cooks in the kitchen to be comfortable with it. But the three of you made it look so easy. I wish I were as uh, good in front of the, <laughs> the internet camera as, as you guys were today. You guys did an a amazing job. It felt like you've been with our team since the get-go last May. You know, we, we should also start thinking about doing something special this May when it's our first anniversary. But welcome, uh, Denise, Stacy, and Shoba, and uh, thanks everybody, all the cooks in the kitchen. Thanks everybody in the audience. Uh, oh, and there's a question from Kathy Sabo. Uh, is all your workshop and cooking lesson? So each of us write up our own thing for the recipes. So it's up to us. And if we've chosen to, we can. Uh, for example, I did include something about Code Blue in my write-up. So Kathy, you should be able to find that. And you should have our contact information. So if you found something amazing that Angelita said, contact her directly. And she, I'm sure she'll be very happy to be, to be supportive. So with that, we're so delighted that you guys joined us. It was a great show. And uh, see you guys soon. Carolyn's going to play this. In the kitchen, plant-based meals to prepare. So many cooks in the kitchen with ideas we're happy to share.